This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 257 of the program. Today is Friday, September 4th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Aaron Cornell, Aaron Washington, Alan Himes, Bruce Collum, Camille DiPaolo, Cyrus Yerif, Don Ankney, Hoho Mixurist, Hugo Florenz, and Julie Watts. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. We have an absolutely gigantic behemoth of an episode for you this week. Right-wingers seem to think that property is more important than human life. We'll talk about that and how police are more cozy with the far right than a lot of us previously suspected. And we're also diving deeper into the depths of authoritarianism as federal judges have now declared that journalists in Portland are not protected from police violence. Also, Trump is being influenced to pursue herd immunity with regard to COVID-19, and the ghost of Herman Cain downplays the severity of COVID-19 after literally dying from it. We'll talk about the movement for a People's Party, Trump's plans for his second term, Joe Biden's Pittsburgh speech, along with Obama's move to crush another social movement, and MSNBC anchors are shocked that young people aren't excited about Joe Biden. We'll talk about that. Also, a right-wing populist comes out against cannabis. And finally, we closed the week by talking to Adam Christensen of Florida. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Since we have so much, let's go ahead and waste no time and get this three hour plus long episode started because whew, it's going to be a lot. Since the start of the Black Lives Matter protests this year after the murder of George Floyd, conservatives have been pretty consistent in condemning the rioting and the looting because that to them is unacceptable because it's violence and we don't condone violent behavior as responsible citizens. But what's interesting is that embedded in their condemnation of violence, ironically, is more violence. The president of the United States literally tweeted out, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Rising stars in the Republican Party, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who will be going to Congress in 2021, created an ad with a gun where she said, if these protesters come to Georgia, I'm going to shoot them and murder them. So if you're conservative, then you don't necessarily unequivocally come out against all violence. If you're these types of conservatives, then um, violence is only bad insofar as violence is being done against property and buildings. But if we're looking at violence done against other human beings, that to them is acceptable. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, conservatives, maybe I'm misrepresenting your views here, but you have a lot of people on your side that apparently seem to want to celebrate the violence that's being done against rioters and looters. Now, maybe I'm just a little bit of a fool to think this, but if you are against rioting and looting, isn't it worse to commit an act of murder? Isn't killing worse than rioting and looting? If you agree with this sentiment, then explain why Ann Coulter, someone who is a prominent conservative with millions of loyal followers, took to Twitter to praise a 17-year-old domestic terrorist who murdered two people and injured a third saying she wants him to be president. Explain to me why Aubrey Huff, a prominent right-wing pundit and podcast host with a bigger platform than mine, called him a national treasure. Explain to me why Christians raised over $250,000 for Rin House on the Christian equivalent of GoFundMe called Give, Send, Go. I mean, I'm just going to take a guess and assume that most of the Christians that donated to this right-wing terrorist call themselves pro-life. But apparently, they're not so pro-life if they're donating to a murderer. I mean, does the people that he killed have to be fetuses in order for you to give a damn? 
So, I mean, what I'm seeing here is right-wingers move closer and closer towards violent fascism. As they condemn violence, they celebrate violence simultaneously, but only if that violence is being done against protesters. Well, I mean, if there's like a hierarchy of violence, I would imagine that killing people is a worse offense than rioting and looting. So if you're outraged by rioting and looting, then certainly you're going to be even more outraged by killing. But I mean, this is what we've come to expect. Republicans in America have become so extreme that we're not just talking about them being proto-fascist. Like they are openly embracing violence and they're celebrating it. And they don't even care how that looks to their opponents. But I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that this is how far to the right Republicans have shifted because look at the way that the media portrays these types of events. New York Post took to Twitter to share an article along with pictures showing the terrorist cleaning up graffiti in Kenosha, Wisconsin. However, when it came to the victim of police violence who was shot in the back 17 times, which sparked these protests in the first place, well, they report that he had a knife in his car when he was shot by police. So in other words, we're supposed to assume that the white terrorist by definition has good intentions can't do any wrong but the black victim he actually maybe deserved it because he had a knife in his car so if you have one of those like fancy switchblades in your car well i guess the police are justified if they pull you over and they feel threatened and they want to kill you only if you're black if you're white it's fine though so do you understand like the media is trying to humanize a terrorist while they dehumanize a victim of state-sanctioned violence. Now, we later learned through a video that surfaced online that the terrorist in question violently assaulted a girl. So, I mean, maybe it's just me, but we probably shouldn't assume that terrorists, people who commit acts of terror in the United States, aren't actually good people because they're white. But that's what everyone seemingly did. Oh, well, he's young and he's white, so of course his intentions were pure. Jacob Blake, however, he had a knife in his car, so I don't know what he was going to do with that. Maybe the cop was justified in shooting him in the back seven different times and paralyzing him likely for the rest of his life. Like, do you understand why people are protesting? This is why. Because this is how the victims of police brutality are treated. Whereas the people who actually commit acts of terror against protesters, protesting violence against black Americans, are propped up celebrated by some on the right and um given a pass by the media because he was probably a good person i mean look at him he was cleaning up graffiti so clearly he had a heart he wasn't just this monster everyone it's disgusting and tucker carlson the host of the number one news show in america did exactly what we're talking about here tried to justify this 17 year old right-wing militant's act of terror take a look so are you really surprised that looting and arson accelerated to murder how shocked are we that 17-year-olds with rifles decided they had to maintain order when no one else would? Now, unsurprisingly, after someone who was very influential defended a terrorist, justified his actions, other people did the same exact thing. Because now I'm seeing so many people say, well, I mean, his intentions were pure. He just went to Kenosha, Wisconsin with a gun because he wanted to stop violence. Because, of course, you know, if you want to de-escalate and stop violence, everyone knows you bring a gun and you aim it at protesters and then you shoot them. Um, of course, that's exactly what happened. Like, imagine if Kyle Rittenhouse was black and he was there to uh, stop violence against protesters. He was aiming his gun at other vigilantes that were threatening the protesters. Do you think that that individual would get the same treatment even if he didn't kill someone? No, he would be automatically demonized because the image of, you know, a white person with a gun conjures up images of freedom and liberty in America, whereas images of a black person with a gun exercising their Second Amendment, right, it conjures up images of fear in America because we are a very racist country. I mean, why do you think Philando Castile, a licensed gun owner, was murdered by the cops and the NRA, the largest gun organization in America, said fuck all about that? It's because we live in a white supremacist country and there's a double standard here. Black people don't even have to be threatening and violence against them is still justified so long as we feel as if they're scary to us. Like, that's what we're dealing with here. 
Now, on top of that, this mindset, uh, you know, it's not just something that we see on Fox News, because on YouTube, you know, a right-wing YouTuber named Keemstar was talking to another reactionary named Leafius here, and Leafius here admitted that, you know, he didn't even have a license to carry a gun, but he attended a protest, I don't know if he's talking about Kenosha, but he attended a protest and he was looking for someone to give him a reason to shoot them. Bro, I wasn't, oh, okay, like, I wasn't on the front lines or whatever, but I did see a police car on fire. Like, that's the most shit I saw, oh. right? I mean, in truth, I don't know if this can even go on story fire, but I just want one day in my life for someone to give me an excuse to shoot them. Is that an extreme opinion? Probably. That was a late last dude. <laughs> People are gonna think I'm like George fucking Zimmerman or something. That was a joke, bro. Kind of. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone. He was just joking. And I'm sure that if a reporter interviewed him there, uh, you know, they'd believe his lies that he's just there to protect order. Disgusting. But I mean, like, you would expect that from right-wing provocateurs like Keemstar like Tucker Carlson, but of course, our enlightened centrists would do better, right? They would condemn this type of violence against protesters, even if they don't like the sight of riots, right? Wrong. The rioting needs to fucking stop. And if that means like white redneck fucking militia dudes out there mowing down dipshit protesters that think that they could torch buildings at 10 p.m., then at this point they have my fucking blessing because holy shit, this fucking shit needs to stop. It needed to stop a long time ago. That is a very prominent Twitch streamer and YouTuber who is a centrist saying that right wing rednecks have his blessing if they want to mow down protesters. That's his language. I mean, even when Destiny started to, like, go off the rails and attack the left, attack people like Michael Brooks and Kyle Kalinske, I still thought, well, I mean, maybe there's some good left in him because he is really useful at de-radicalizing some of these right-wing people who, like, kind of get stuck in that alt-right pipeline on YouTube. But now, I don't think that's going to de-radicalize anyone. If anything, he's helping them. He's making their argument for them. So Destiny literally thinks that private property is more valuable than the lives of human beings. I mean, this is what a capitalist cult looks like. I don't like these riots. I don't like the looting. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It probably hurts Joe Biden's chances against Donald Trump. Uh, so I think that if people want to kill them, that's fine. Because if these protests go away, that makes me feel better. I mean, American culture is sick. It's perverted. But I mean, this kind of response to violence against protesters, it's nothing new. Because back in 2017... The Daily Caller, a prominent right-wing website, spread a video of cars driving through crowds of people, protesters. And they thought it was funny, like they were literally glorifying it with funny music. Move, bitch. Get out the way. Get out the way, bitch, get out the way and move And move, bitch Get out the way and get out the way, bitch, get out the way and This is all just a funny game to them. And Fox News also shared that same video. They thought it was hilarious too, I'm assuming. I mean, it's interesting because the Daily Caller knew that their right-wing audience would be more triggered by profanity than the sight of cars driving into crowds of people. So they said, you know, if you don't like the profanity, then just mute your computer. I mean, imagine being so twisted to think that profanity is more offensive than cars driving through crowds of people, possibly injuring these individuals. Now, you know, if you think that it's wrong for crowds of protesters to block traffic, ask any of these right wingers. How they would respond if pro-Guaido forces in Venezuela were blocking traffic and a pro-Maduro driver decided to just plow through that crowd of pro-Guaido protesters. They would be calling for regime change. They'd be condemning the violence against protesters. But because it suits their narrative, because they don't like these protesters, they think it's a game. To literally run people over, that to them is funny. It's a, it's a joke to them. This is how little they value human life, but yet they claim that they are pro-life and that it's Democrats who want to kill babies. Interesting. Now, what makes matters worse is that this isn't something that, you know, the media promotes 
in a vacuum. I mean, our leaders do the same thing. Donald Trump just tweeted out, the only way you will stop the violence in the high crime Democrat run cities is through strength. Now, in case it wasn't clear to you, he was using strength as a synonym for violence. We know exactly what he means. Now, it's been days, and Donald Trump, at the time I record this, still hasn't condemned Kyle Rittenhouse, one of his own supporters who was in the front row at a Donald Trump rally in January. He said nothing after one of his supporters carried out a terrorist attack in America after he is fear-mongering about these protesters. Does the president condemn the actions of Kyle Rittenhouse, who is accused of shooting some of the protesters? Um, the president um, is not going to again weigh in on that. Um, uh, you can ask him this evening. He may weigh in further, but at the moment, um, he's not weighing into that. It's been days and he won't condemn one of his own supporters who carried out an act of murder. Imagine what he'd be saying if somebody carried out murder on behalf of Joe Biden. He would call on Joe Biden to condemn that individual. But when it's him, crickets, nothing. Are you going to condemn the actions of vigilantes like Kyle Rittenhouse? And well, we're, we're looking at all of it. Uh, that was an interesting situation. You saw the same tape as I saw. And uh, he was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like. And he fell. And then they very violently attacked him. And it was something that we're looking at right now. And it's under investigation. But uh, I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed, but it's under, it's under investigation. The sense that you should be getting if you're a reasonable person is that in our late stage capitalist society, on the hierarchy of things that we care about, we definitely care more about property damage than deaths and human suffering. Human beings dying, getting murdered, that is less offensive than people doing riots and looting. I mean, if you feel like we're in the twilight zone and maybe you're going crazy, you're not going crazy. Everyone else has gone crazy. Everyone else has bought in to this idea that we should dehumanize human beings because property is much more valuable than human life. Now, I'm sure that the right is at least going to start pretending at least to care about human life because one of their own was killed in a clash on Saturday in Portland, Oregon. As Mike Baker of the New York Times reports, a man affiliated with the right-wing group was shot and killed on Saturday as a large group of supporters of President Trump traveled in a caravan through downtown Portland, Oregon, which has seen nightly protests for three consecutive months. The pro-Trump rally drew hundreds of trucks full of supporters into the city. At times, Trump supporters and counter-protesters clashed on the streets, with people shooting paintball guns from the beds of pickup trucks and protesters throwing objects back at them. A video that purports to be of the Saturday night shooting in Portland, taken from the far side of the street, showed a small group of people in the road outside what appears to be a parking garage. Gunfire erupts and a man collapses in the street. The man who was shot and killed was wearing a hat with insignia of Patriot Prayer, a far-right group based in the Portland area that has clashed with protesters in the past. Joey Gibson, the head of the group, said Sunday he could not share many details but could confirm the man was a good friend and supporter of Patriot Prayer. Two weeks ago, one right-wing demonstrator fired two gunshots from his vehicle, the authorities have said, although it doesn't appear anyone was struck by the bullets. The next weekend, opposing groups openly fought in the streets, and a video showed one right-wing demonstrator brandishing a gun. Patriot Prayer, a local group that says it promotes Christianity and smaller government, has repeatedly clashed with activists in Portland. The group has at times operated alongside militia groups, and the Southern Poverty Law Center has reported that some Patriot Prayer events have drawn white supremacists. Last year, Mr. Gibson, the group's leader, was charged, along with others, with rioting after a brawl in the city. So, I mean, I read this and it feels like we're on the cusp of a literal civil war. This is, uh, horrifying. And it doesn't help that we have a president who is constantly fanning the flames here. Now, this group, Patriot Prayer, is a far-right extremist group that confronts and provokes protesters oftentimes in an attempt to do violence. They were caught with guns on a rooftop, as this tweet points out, and they were likely there trying to do vigilante justice, and one of them got killed. Now, to me, it's easy for me to condemn killing and death because I'm a humanist, right? I don't celebrate that someone on the opposing team was murdered. 
I didn't want him to get killed. I wanted him to get converted. But now, I bet that we're going to see a little bit of a tune change from the right and suggest that it's really the left and Black Lives Matter protesters who were the ones who are doing violence, even if this individual was with a group that shows up to provoke protesters. Like, it doesn't matter. Regardless of the outcome of the situation, the protesters, the rioters, the looters, they're the bad guys. Let's not even try to figure out why they're rioting and looting for so long. They're just the bad guys. And since we've already determined as a society that they're the bad guys, no matter what is done to them is justified. So that means if we want to shoot at them and murder them, well, that's justified because we've accepted as a society that property damage is uh, worse than murder. That's basically where we're at. I mean, even if you're against rioting and looting, which most people are, just like accept that there's got to be an underlying reason why people are out in the streets. Sure, there's some people who just show up to start shit, right? Who are bored and have nothing better to do. But a lot of these people feel as if they have no choice but to make a lot of noise. Riot, loot, because the government isn't listening. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, anything that they do is justified because the government isn't taking action to protect black lives. But what I'm saying is that there's more nuanced to this situation. But because in America, we've dehumanized people, and because we view private property as more important than human life, well, this is what we get. Where even centrists are okay with these rioters and looters getting shot and killed. Well, I mean, if you're against rioting and looting, if politicians are against rioting and looting, you can try to do some reform, like any reform, to address their concerns. But I guess that it's easier to just demonize them and, um condone violence against them by these right-wing militia groups. Well, it backfired. Like, one of these right-wing people were killed. And it's going to get worse. Like, the violence is going to continue to happen. And it's depressing. But you'd expect at least some level of respect for human life on the side that claims to be pro-life. But they're celebrating Kyle Rittenhouse. He's a hero to them because he murdered two rioters I don't even know if those people were rioting that he killed. But I mean, because he was there protecting order, he's a hero. I don't even know what to say, but um, America is a very, very disgraceful country. And um, it's really, it's sickening. Like, our culture is corrupted to its core. And I don't even know if it's redeemable. Like, for people to openly celebrate protesters being assaulted and run over and even murdered i mean that culture has accepted the fact that violence is permissible and once you have a society that accepts violence as a justifiable thing against a particular group of people guess what society devolves into pure chaos fascism Part of what made the Kyle Rittenhouse story so outrageous, aside from the fact that he literally murdered people, is the fact that he was walking alongside police officers. This was a 17-year-old child with a gun who showed up to maintain order, and police officers gave him water. Police officers thanked him and the other vigilantes for being there, rather than saying, no, you don't have the training, we're the ones with the training, you shouldn't be carrying a weapon, you can hurt someone, they embraced this individual who went on to commit a terrorist attack. This is why communities of color don't trust police departments. Now, there's been other stories of police officers working with the Proud Boys. I mean, we learned that police in Kenosha notified the vigilantes and let them know that they were pushing protesters towards them, which is when Kyle Brandenhouse ended up shooting two of them. But this phenomenon of police officers getting cozy with the far right, it's way more prevalent than people want to admit. And there's a report from The Guardian that talks about this and how it's a little bit alarming that nobody's sounding the alarms about this and talking about this in the mainstream media. So in an op-ed for The Guardian, Mike German writes, For decades, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has routinely warned its agents that the white supremacist and far-right militant groups it investigates often have links to law enforcement. Yet, the Justice Department has no national strategy designated to protect the communities policed by these dangerously compromised 
compromised law enforcers. As our nation grapples with how to reimagine public safety in the wake of the protests following the police killing of George Floyd, it is time to confront and resolve the persistent problem of explicit racism in law enforcement. I know about these routine warnings because I received them as a young FBI agent preparing to accept undercover assignment against neo-Nazi groups in Los Angeles, California in 1992. But you don't have to take my word for it. A redacted version of a 2006 FBI intelligence assessment, white supremacist infiltration of law enforcement, alerted agents to both strategic infiltration by organized groups and self-initiated infiltration by law enforcement personnel sympathetic to white supremacist causes. A leaked 2015 counterterrorism policy guide made the case more directly, warning agents that FBI domestic terrorism investigations focused on militia extremists, white supremacist extremists, and sovereign citizen extremists often have identified active links to law enforcement officers. If the government knew that Al-Qaeda or ISIS had infiltrated American law enforcement agencies, it would undoubtedly initiate a nationwide effort to investigate them and neutralize the threat they posed, yet white supremacists and far-right militants have committed far more attacks and killed more people in the U.S. over the last 10 years than any foreign terrorist movement. The FBI regards them as the most lethal domestic terror threat. The need for national action is even more critical. In recent years, white supremacists have engaged in deadly rampages in Charleston, South Carolina, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and El Paso, Texas. More ominously, neo-Nazis obtained radiological materials to manufacture dirty bombs in separate cases in Maine in 2009 and Florida in 2017, which were only avoided through chance. But in June 2019, when Congressman William Lacey Clay asked the FBI counterterrorism chief, Michael McGarity, whether the Bureau remained concerned about white supremacists infiltration of law enforcement since the publication of its 2006 assessment, McGarity indicated he had not read it. Asked more generally about this infiltration, McGarity said he would be suspect of white supremacist police officers, but that their ideology was a First Amendment protected right. More importantly, the FBI's 2015 counterterrorism policy, which McGarity was responsible for executing, indicates not just that members of law enforcement might hold white supremacist views, but that FBI domestic terror Terrorism investigations have often identified, quote unquote, active links between the subjects of these investigations and law enforcement officials. So this is disturbing to any sane person. Of course, we don't want white supremacists infiltrating police forces. They already are biased enough. They already exist in this culture where they dehumanized people and feel as if they're always under attack. And even if you want to be a good cop and do the right thing and report police misconduct, you're dissuaded from doing that. You'll be outcasted. You'll lose your job, possibly. So, you know, they are complicit because they are bullied into silence. And that's if you have the intent to do good. It's a culture that needs to change. We need systemic reform. And this story proves it because it's such an issue that the FBI is pointing it out, saying, hey, are we going to do anything about this? You have white supremacists with active links to law enforcement. This is not okay. But when we see police officers coordinating with or working with Proud Boys, we kind of just like chalk that up to being an isolated incident. And we, you know, rightfully call it out for being the scandal that it is. But the news just moves on when they don't talk about this being a systemic issue that really needs to be looked into further. It needs to be investigated with urgency because if there are white supremacists, in law enforcement, that's not just them like exercising their First Amendment right. In fact, McGarity was wrong to say that because, you know, to hold a belief isn't exercising your First Amendment right. But you should not have those beliefs if you're in law enforcement. Those types of individuals who are white supremacists and aligned with right wing militant groups should be rooted out of law enforcement, of course. But the fact that we even have to say that, even have to talk about this as an issue shows how deep the problem goes with policing in this country, which is why people are saying we have to defund the police because police can't respond to all of these issues. They just can't. Like throwing more police at the scene isn't going to reduce crime. So this is terrifying. Um, the issue is more widespread than we thought. And the fact that there's no action surrounding this uh, is, uh, is frustrating. 
So I was previously mistakenly under the impression that democracies are supposed to protect journalists, but apparently that's not what we do in America. Because a federal court just ruled that journalists and legal observers are not exempt from violence by police officers. This is a thing that happened in the United States of America. Quote unquote, democracy. Yeah. So as Luke Barr of ABC News reports, a three-judge panel on Thursday temporarily halted protections for journalists and legal observers covering the unrest in Portland, Oregon. Last week, federal judge Michael Simon ruled that journalists and legal observers were exempt from federal officers' physical force, arrest, or other treatment if the officers reasonably know that a person is a journalist or a legal observer. But in a two-to-one decision, the judges on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with the government that Judge Simon's initial rule was too broad, given the order's breadth and lack of clarity, particularly in its non-exclusive indicia of who qualifies as journalists and legal observers, appellants have also demonstrated that in the absence of a stay, the order will cause irreparable harm to law enforcement efforts and personnel. Two of the three judges wrote, this means that journalists could be subjected to the same physical force as that of the individuals participating. Attorney General William Barr said in a statement that he thought the decision was an important step. So there are so many things wrong with this story, but first of all, let's just point out the obvious. Two out of three judges just ruled that law enforcement efforts will be irreparably harmed if they're not allowed to do violence against people who they know are journalists. No, no, no. We have to do violence against journalists, even if they tell us that they're journalists and they have a camera or they, you know, have some sort of logo from a news agency. We have to do violence against them because if we don't, then our law enforcement efforts will be harmed irreparably. So we, we have to. Shocking. Now, what's interesting about all of this is this underlying assumption that it's acceptable to do violence against the protesters. Like, of course, we want journalists and legal observers to be protected because we have to know what's going on. We need witnesses there documenting what's happening. But there's this underlying assumption that it's acceptable for police to use force and violence against protesters. So if someone is out there exercising their First Amendment right, we're to the point now in America where we're just okay with police using force against them. I mean, after the George Floyd protests broke out, I covered the content of police officers using force, pepper spraying, you know, uh, tear gassing journalists, even after they say they're journalists, but people who weren't even doing anything wrong, they were cornered by police officers and tear gassed. Like we're using chemical weapons against American citizens, weapons that are banned during wars because they're considered a war crime banned by the Geneva Convention. And, you know, this is just the norm. We've accepted it. Not only are police well within their right to just do violence against protesters, but, you know, cities can impose curfews now, tell people that they can't exercise their First Amendment right after a certain period of time. Uh, and now it's acceptable for police officers to use force against journalists because they have to. And the Justice Department, William Barr, Attorney General, is applauding this. Let me remind you, the Justice Department is our Justice Department. William Barr is supposed to be looking out for the American people. Our justice is what he should be fighting for, not the justice of Donald Trump and his administration. Like, he's not supposed to be an advocate for Donald Trump. He's supposed to be an advocate for the people. But, you know, he's saying, oh, this is, this is really an important step because we have to make sure that law enforcement can literally assault people and do violence against people who they know are journalists. Now, sure, it's the case that maybe there's some gray areas. Maybe someone might not look like a journalist. Maybe, you know, sometimes people, you know, aren't professionals. Maybe they're amateurs and they're there and they're starting shit under the guise of being a journalist. But how frequently that, does that happen? Like, is this really the route that we want to go down? Because sometimes there's gray areas. We just say, no, police officers don't have to respect the First Amendment and journalism. This is, um, this is so depressing. And 
I'm not being hyperbolic to say that we are watching democracy slip away before our very eyes. And this should scare everyone, but it feels like we're hopeless and there's nothing we can do about it. We're losing the right to protest. Uh, nobody, you know, questions the imposition of curfews anymore. Nobody, uh, you know, seems to care that we're using chemical weapons against American citizens with tear gas. Um, police officers are also targeting people who are administering, you know, um, medical to protesters. I mean, th this is like a rogue failed state with a rogue armed militia known as the police just targeting anyone who they want to. Like, there's no checks, no balances. It's all just slipping away. This is deeply disturbing. And the fact that media isn't talking about this, it's an indictment on them as well. COVID has taken this year, just since the outbreak, has taken more than 100 years. Look, here's the lives. It's just, it's, when you think about it, more lives this year than any other year for the past 100 years. Nailed it. <laughs> oh my God, Joe, what are you doing? Stay in your basement. Don't come out of hiding until November 4th. Like, that was bad. Now, that was a clip from a speech that Joe Biden gave in Pittsburgh where he responded to the civil unrest, the violence, and some attacks that Donald Trump had recently lobbed against him. And even though centrists are really happy with this speech that he gave, me, not so much, because it really shows that he is, uh, he's tone deaf, right? He's not really listening to the protesters. He's not listening to Americans. And in a way, like, he walked into numerous traps that Donald Trump said, and by saying the things that he said, like, he's playing right into Donald Trump's hand. And after 2016, like, you think that Democrats would be more effective at responding to Donald Trump's attacks, or at least know how to brush them off? Joe Biden very clearly demonstrated that he doesn't necessarily know how to respond capably to attacks from Donald Trump. So the first thing he did was condemn the violence, the rioting and the looting. Take a look. I want to make it absolutely clear, something very clear about all of this. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Setting fires is not protesting. None of this is protesting. It's lawlessness, plain and simple. And those who do it, should be prosecuted. Violence will not bring change. It will only bring destruction. It's wrong in every way. It divides instead of unites. Destroys businesses, only hurts the working families that serve the community. It makes things worse across the board, not better. No, it's not what uh, Dr. King or John Lewis taught. And it must end. Fires are burning and we have a president who fans the flames rather than fighting the flames. But we must not burn. We have to build. This president long ago forfeited any moral leadership in this country. He can't stop the violence because for years he's fomented it. You know, he may believe mouthing the words law and order makes him strong. But his failure to call on his own supporters to stop acting as an armed militia in this country shows how weak he is. Does anyone believe there'll be less violence in America if Donald Trump is reelected? We need justice in America. We need safety in America. We're facing multiple crises. Crises under Donald Trump have kept multiplying. COVID, economic devastation, unwarranted police violence, emboldened white nationalists, a reckoning on race, declining faith in the birth and the, of the right American future. There's no reason why we can't just do so much more than we're doing. The common thread, the incumbent president who makes things worse, not better, an incumbent president who sows chaos rather than providing order, an incumbent president who fails in the basic duty of the job, which is to advance the truth that all of us know, that we're all born with the right to life. All right, we'll stop it right there because I don't need to hear any insufferable platitudes. We heard enough at the DNC convention. But basically, point blank, he says, uh, 
rioting is not protesting, looting is not protesting, setting fires is not protesting. Now, I am not naive enough to think that Joe Biden would come out and say, I am pro-rioting, pro-looting, Joe Biden, like he's not going to say that, of course. But embedded in that condemnation of looting and rioting that we all expect from him should be at least a small signal that he understands that people are in the streets because there is real pain that they feel. They feel like the system has failed them. So they have no choice. They have nothing left to do. So they're just burning this whole system down, rioting, looting, because government isn't listening to them. So what else are they supposed to do? I mean, they protest and nobody listens. Colin Kaepernick takes a knee and even Democrats like Ruth Bader Ginsburg condemns him and calls it stupid. Obama says that he hopes he realizes how Colin Kaepernick is hurting people. So they protest and that's bad. But if they riot and loot and get people to pay attention, then that's still bad. So it's like they're in this lose-lose predicament. Nothing they ever say or do is going to persuade people. I mean, when they protest, they say defund the police. Joe Biden responds by saying, actually, I'm going to increase funding for the police. Well, why do they need more money? Like, for more implicit bias training? Clearly, that isn't effective. That's not working. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what we saw from him here was just him being tone deaf and out of touch. This is why people aren't enthusiastic for Joe Biden. He just, he doesn't get it. He's the wrong person for this moment. But believe it or not, it gets even worse. Ask yourself, do I look like a radical socialist with a soft spot for rioters? Really? I want a safe America, safe from COVID, safe from crime and looting, safe from racially motivated violence, safe from bad cops. Let me be crystal clear, safe from four more years of Donald Trump. I look at this violence and I see lives and communities and the dreams of small businesses being destroyed and the opportunity for real progress on the issues of race and police reform and justice being put to the test. Donald Trump looks at this violence and he sees a political lifeline. Having failed to protect this nation from the virus that has killed more than 180,000 Americans so far, Trump posts an all caps tweet screaming law and order to save his campaign. One of his closest political advisors in the White House doesn't even bother to speak in code. She just comes out and she says it. Quote, the more chaos, violence, the better it is for Trump's reelection. Just think about that. This is a sitting president of the United States of America. He's supposed to be protecting this country, but instead he's rooting for chaos and violence. The simple truth is, Donald Trump failed to protect America. So now he's trying to scare America. So again, he's not necessarily wrong. Like, I don't hate everything that he said there, but it's largely tone deaf because rather than just responding to Donald Trump calling you a socialist by saying, no, I'm not, nuh-uh, what you can actually do is try to retake that narrative back, right? Say, well, you know, if caring for Americans makes me a socialist, then I will happily own that title. I don't have to be a socialist to realize that we need fundamental changes in this country. If I'm a socialist for the poor, then I guess Donald Trump is a socialist for the rich. But I mean, Joe Biden can't say any of this because he doesn't believe any of this. He doesn't believe in any structural changes that are substantial. He doesn't believe in this. So he has no way of meaningfully responding to these attacks, which is why I said during the primaries, it'd actually be nice it might be an asset to Democrats if they had someone as the nominee who identified as a socialist, because at least then you can attempt to educate people and explain to them what you mean by saying you're a socialist rather than run away from it. Because just running away from it, saying I'm not a socialist, like you're not taking back the narrative effectively. But I mean, Democrats do this all the time. They know exactly what Republicans are going to say, and they still don't know how to respond to that same playbook that they've used for decades now. But Joe Biden went on to make a point about Donald Trump's bizarre attack because Donald Trump oddly has been saying all of this violence is happening in Joe Biden's America when you're president. So that's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. And Joe Biden responded to that. But there's still something missing, even if I think that most of what he said here 
it's pretty spot on. Trump and Pence are running on this, and I find it fascinating. Quote, you won't be saving Joe Biden's America. And what's their proof? The violence we're seeing in Donald Trump's America. These are not images of some imagined Joe Biden America in the future. These are images of Donald Trump's America today. He keeps telling you, if only he was president, it wouldn't happen. If he was president, he keeps telling us that he was president, you'd feel safe. Well, he is president, whether he knows it or not. And it is happening. It's getting worse. And you know why? Because Donald Trump adds fuel to every fire. So I'm not sure why he hasn't made this exact point. Like the moment Trump started saying that all of this violence is because of Biden's America, like that doesn't even make sense. You're the president. So I'm glad that he's finally saying it. Um, on top of that, um, he says that violence is getting worse because Donald Trump is fanning the flames. That's accurate. That's correct. So most of what he said here is fine. But there's one missing variable that he still doesn't address. Why were there riots and looting in Kenosha, Wisconsin? It was peaceful until a police officer shot Jacob Blake in the back seven times. So you can't just say Trump is the reason why things are the way that they are. Like you have to speak to the specific pain of these communities. You are the architect of the crime bill. And in response to calls for police to be defunded, you are defiant. You're saying, I want to increase funding to police departments. Like you have to demonstrate that you care. And he hasn't done this. He just hasn't been sufficient. We get, you know, more liberal solutions, more committees to address the problems, more money for the police departments so they can put that towards body cameras and implicit bias training. But at the end of the day, I mean, we see how brazen police officers are where we've had months of protests in cities across the country and a police officer still shoots an unarmed black man seven times in the back. So if they're going to do that, you're going to need more than implicit bias training. So you just have to at least express in some way to people, you understand the scope of this issue and how big it is and what we need to do to change it. But you just, you're not doing that. You're not meeting this moment. But I want to play one more clip for you because this is the worst thing that we've seen here. It doesn't have to be this way. When President Obama and I were in the White House, we had to defend federal property. We did it. We didn't see it. You didn't see us whipping up fears around the deployment of secret federal troops. We just did our job. And the federal property was protected. When President Obama and I were in office, we didn't look at cities as Democratic or Republican run. These are American cities. But Trump doesn't see him himself as president for all of America. Frankly, I believe if I were president today, the country would be safer and we'd be seeing a lot less violence. And here's why. I have said we must address the issue of racial injustice. I've personally spoken to George Floyd's family and to Jacob Blake's family. I know their pain, and so do you. I know the justice they seek, and so do you. They've told us none of this violence respects or honors George or Jacob. I believe we can bring these, 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 these folks fighting for racial justice to the table. I've worked with police in this country for many years. I know most cops are good, decent people. I know how they risk their lives every time they put that shield on and go out the door. And I'm confident I can bring the police to the table as well. I'd make sure every mayor and governor had the support they needed from the federal government. But I wouldn't be looking to use the United States military against our own people. If I were president, my language would be less divisive. I'd be looking to lower the temperature in this country, not raise it. I'd be looking to unite the nation. That to me was by far the worst moment from this speech because the underlying implication of that is that Donald Trump isn't necessarily wrong for deploying secret police to Portland to kidnap people in unmarked vehicles. He's just wrong to like scare people after doing it. I don't even know what to say about that. He says, when President Obama and I were in the White House, we had to defend federal property. We did it. You didn't see us whipping up fears around the deployment of secret federal troops. 
we just did our job and federal property was protected. So in other words, you're telling people in the streets, you agree with Trump. You just don't agree with the way that he's doing things. You'd be less divisive as you try to violently crush protests. Like that's the message that I get if I'm someone in the streets listening to this. Like, I can't even believe you would say this as the Democratic Party's nominee. This isn't a gotcha to Donald Trump. This is a gotcha to yourself. It's a self-own. Now, I do believe that Joe Biden would in fact be more you know, inclusive, less divisive than Donald Trump when it comes to these issues. I'm glad that he's in contact with the families of George Floyd and Jacob Blake, but again, he doesn't get it. Like, his goal is to bring racial justice advocates and police together and, like, let them just talk it out. That's kind of what I got from that. And he says, you know, most cops are good, except even the quote-unquote good cops are susceptible to a culture of violence and racism. And even if they're a good cop that wants to report police misconduct or racism, they're dissuaded from doing that. And that's not going to change if you offer up more implicit bias training. Like, you need to change the system entirely. Anything short of systemic change isn't going to do the trick. Also, how is this going to happen if you're promising to bring both sides to the table and one side not just has more power, but it has powerful unions, well-funded unions to protect them? Unions that are institutions that are resistant to change, by the way. And, you know, the other side is fighting the entire system with white supremacy embedded in it. Like, these are not equal and opposite sides. There's a power imbalance here that you're not grasping or at least letting us know that you understand. How are you going to be different than Donald Trump? Like, how can you assure people that unlike Trump, you're going to stop the violence when you don't even really communicate to us that you understand why it's taking place in the first place? Understand, you can dislike the rioting and the looting, but understand, none of this would be a thing right now if police officers weren't killing black Americans with impunity. Like, you understand that, right? Like, you have to communicate to us that you get that. All of the rioting, all of the looting would not be happening right now if this wasn't an issue that reached a tipping point. So, I mean, I see this speech from Joe Biden and I just think, this is why nobody's excited to support him, right? And if he wins, it will be because there are enough anti-Trump voters that were motivated to come out and uh, support him. But I mean... It just feels like at this point, like he's playing into Trump's hands and he doesn't know how to respond to Donald Trump. And as a result, he's kind of fumbling it. Like the best thing to do would be hide away until this election is over. Otherwise, like you're going to keep putting your foot in your mouth and you're going to make matters worse. Like, I don't know if there's anything you can say to um, make people, you know, feel more comfort knowing that you'd be president and you do things different when you just admitted that you kind of agree with Donald Trump. You just disagree with the way he does things, but you agree with the things that he's doing. Like you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. So it's best to just say nothing, stay inside until after this election and shut up if you're going to say things like this. But I mean, apparently, you know, I'm in the minority, I guess, because centrists seem to think that he had a lot of, like, mic drop moments, and there were some good moments there, I'm not gonna lie, and detract from all of it, but, you know, if you are in the streets right now protesting, are you gonna come away from that speech thinking that Joe Biden is on your side? I don't know, probably not, but, you know, if you come away from that feeling like he's not on your side, then does that mean you're gonna vote for him? I don't know. So, it's just, um, it feels like, you know, Democrats are always snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory and i kind of like got that sense from this speech joe biden doesn't know what to say uh he just makes matters worse for himself um when you know you just kind of give trump enough rope to hang himself and you could just win because he's a big enough dumbass to keep saying stupid things but joe biden comes in and tries to like one-up donald trump in some ways and it's just it's sad to watch because Democrats are blowing it, and I hope that they don't blow it, but, I mean, when you say things like this, it's just, you can't help but feel hopeless. I always really like to watch when an out-of-touch pundit is shocked with information from, you know, the poors and the peasants that they weren't necessarily privy to. So, someone who was at the protests as a journalist and a professor let them know how a lot of these young people feel about Joe Biden. And they were absolutely blown away to learn that young people aren't very enthusiastic about Joe Biden. What impact do you foresee their movement having on the election? 
Yeah, I spend a lot of time at protests, especially with the youth. Um, I've, I've, you know, been there from a personal reason, but also from an academic reason as well. I ask people there, you know, what are you going to do in November? Why are you here? What are you going to do in November? And they say, I'm not going to show up because Bernie is not on the ticket. And I think wow. that this highlights a bigger point, you know, which is that even though we had this Democratic National Convention that was meant to unify a party, the DNC did not bring in the youth, you know, and I think they need to do a better job of giving folks who have legitimate concerns about the direction of this country and their own interactions with institutions, including law enforcement. Right. To be to be viewed, to be seen, to be heard and to be included in the plot. Mm. We're going to leave it there. Nazita Lajravati, thank you. I don't understand why they don't understand why young people are not excited about Joe Biden. This is the same individual who said he has no empathy for young people. He refuses to support Medicare for all during a pandemic. And when protesters all in unison say defund the police, what does he say? No, I'm going to increase funding for police stations like why would you think young people are excited? I Like, I don't understand how you're failing to see why young people aren't enthusiastic about Joe Biden. Like, did you think that would change? We knew that Joe Biden had a problem with young voters during the primaries. Did you think that would change because he's the nominee? No. If we've learned anything about young voters and their voting habits is that if they don't like a candidate... They don't usually suck it up and vote for that individual. They just don't vote. Getting young people to the polls in the first place in and of itself is a challenge. Why would that just change all of a sudden? You guys told us Joe Biden is the most electable. MSNBC pushed this narrative repeatedly all during the primaries. So now you're shocked that the person who you pushed forward all of a sudden isn't winning over hearts and minds? Like, what did you expect? I don't get it. How are you confused? I don't understand why you don't understand. As I said, it just, <laughs> these people are so insufferable. So she said, I spent a lot of time at the protests, especially with the youth. And a lot of people she asked, uh, had said, I'm not going to show up because Bernie's not on the ticket. Now, when she said that, one of the anchors actually said, wow. And um, she also said that the DNC convention was meant to unify the party, but the DNC did not bring in the youth. This is the sense that I get from like MSNBC liberals and centrists. They thought that like once Joe Biden announced his running mate, a young woman, a young woman of color in, you know, Kamala Harris, you know, that would ignite the spark and get young people excited about Joe Biden. Except young people care about policy. Who is Kamala? She is the top cop in California who laughed about the prospect of legal weed and locked up lots of people of color. Do you think that young people of color don't know about this? Now, if she had a change of heart, great. But I mean, she's still terrible. She voted against even a 10% cut to the military budget. She moved away from Medicare for All as soon as she got any pressure. Why would you think that a running mate is going to ignite the spark? They just don't get it. But I mean, look, if you don't get it, that's fine. You're in D.C., you're in that bubble. We're all in our own echo chambers. But there's something that you can do if you genuinely want to understand what's happening. You can bring on more leftist voices. How often do we see MSNBC bring on left-wing people? It's rare. It's very rare. On Meet the Press with Chuck Todd, he brings on right-wing panels all the time to talk about issues related to looting and rioting and Black Lives Matter. Like, how is that supposed to solve anything? One of the most popular shows on MSNBC is a show hosted by a Republican, Joe Scar Scarborough. I just, they don't understand it and they don't want to understand because if they did want to understand it, they would bring on different voices. Now, I uh, just discovered a YouTube channel about a month ago called All Gas, No Breaks, where this guy goes around the country and just interviews people, and he doesn't necessarily, like, interject any commentary himself. He just gives people a microphone and lets them talk, and there was a portion of the last video who he put out that stood out to me, where he asked some Portland protesters what they thought of Joe Biden and how excited they were, and you can tell even, like, by the way he framed this question, he already knew what the answer was going to be. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how stoked are you guys about presidential candidate Joe Biden? Zero. Absolutely fucking zero. He has um, an affinity for uh, fucking children. So do you guys plan to vote for Trump instead? I'm going to vote for anarchy. 
That was interesting. Now, unless those people are, you know, some sort of psychopathic Pizzagate conspiracy theorists, either they were joking or referring most likely to the creepy videos of Joe Biden touching young girls and women in general. That's probably what they were referring to. And if you are a normal person, you're probably turned off by that or a little disgusted by it because who isn't? Who isn't? Now, those people in that video, like, I don't believe they are your average representative of people at the protests. But what I do think they represent is a common sentiment that you're going to find within people who are protesting. Because, I mean, a lot of people who have been worried about police brutality and who have supported the Black Lives Matter movement, who are in the streets constantly, like now that Joe Biden is the nominee and he's talking about increasing funding for police and he's remaining defiant, they probably feel like I have no choice now. Now I have to do rioting because... I mean, Joe Biden is not going to do any fundamental changes. He said nothing will fundamentally change if I'm president. So if Trump isn't going to change jack shit, and he's just going to try to violently stop the protests, and if Biden is going to get in and sit on his ass and not do anything, what choice am I left with? I have to protest. I have to take to the streets. So, I mean, if you ask people there, they're probably going to say, no, I'm not very excited about Joe Biden. That's what the MSNBC anchor who was interviewed said and you know you can tell that that's what that interviewer in the all gas no breaks video expected because he said on a scale from zero to ten how excited are you for for joe biden and he was really sarcastic like you can hear it in his voice and he doesn't usually like inject his own commentary into these videos but you just like it, you know young people aren't excited about joe biden but the thing is that there's still a lot of time before the election he can change that he can unequivocally support at least one bold policy, Medicare for all, legal weed. And I've said even before, like, he doesn't even have to take it that far. He doesn't even have to promote a new policy. He could take one of his existing policies and just talk about it nonstop. Like, I believe he supports a $15 minimum wage. Why haven't we heard you talking about the minimum wage? You adopted some elements of Bernie's climate change plan. How are you not talking about this? Instead, you know, we hear him reiterating that, you know, he definitely doesn't want to ban fracking. I mean, it's just, how could you be confused at this point? Joe Biden had this enthusiasm problem before. And the media still pushed him anyway, or anyone but Bernie. So, I mean, you made your bed, lie in it. The only problem is that MSNBC's rich pundits, they don't have to really worry about the worst of what Donald Trump has to offer because they're shielded regardless of who's president. But, you know, their propaganda has led us to this situation. And now they're pretending like it's so shocking that young people aren't excited about Joe Biden. Yeah, no shit. Maybe you should have thought about that before you pushed him as the most electable candidate. Many people give Michael Moore credit, and I think rightfully so, because back in 2016, he was one of the few people to predict Donald Trump's victory. Now, I watched the show he was on. He was on Bill Maher's program, and he said, uh, you know, I think Donald Trump is going to win. Now, when he said that, I didn't actually think he was being serious. I thought that he was just saying that as a way to try to motivate people to get out and support Hillary Clinton, to make people think that her win wasn't inevitable. So, you know, I didn't necessarily believe him. And I was one of the individuals who thought, I mean, it's Hillary Clinton, but there's no way she's going to lose to a reality television show star. Like, it's going to be close, but she's probably going to pull it off. But he ended up being right. He was proving right. So he gets that cloud. Um, and he is, once again, sounding the alarm, letting people know Trump may pull off another 2016. Joe Biden's victory is not a foregone conclusion. And at this point, it's looking less and less likely. So on Facebook, Michael Moore shared a poll of Biden and Donald Trump in battleground states, which shows Joe Biden currently only has a one point lead over Donald Trump on average. Now, he followed this up with a Facebook post saying, sorry to have to provide the reality check again. But when CNN polled registered voters in August in just the swing states, Biden and Trump were in a virtual tie. In Minnesota, it's 47-47. In Michigan, where Biden had a big lead, Trump has closed the gap to four points. Are you ready for a Trump victory? Are you mentally prepared to be outsmarted by Trump again? Do you find comfort in your certainty that there is no way Trump can win? Are you content with the trust you've placed in the DNC to pull this off? The Biden campaign just announced he'll be visiting a number of states, but not Michigan. Sound familiar?
I'm warning you almost 10 weeks in advance, the enthusiasm level for the 60 million in Trump's base is off the charts. For Joe, not so much. Don't leave it to the Democrats to get rid of Trump. You have to get rid of Trump. We have to wake up every day for the next 67 days and make sure each of us are going to get 100 people out to vote. Act now. So with the way that he words this, you know, it leads me to believe that my assumption about his prediction in 2016 is correct. Like, he's saying this to motivate people. But do I think that he actually sees the writing on the wall, thinks that Democrats could blow this? I do. So now I see this, obviously, since it's really explicit, as a type of motivator to get people to get active, to get out and vote. But I also see him as uh, trying to sound the alarm and let people know Trump could win. Now... Again, this is still, you know, not a foregone conclusion. Like, I feel as if it's a 50-50. Like, I don't think any one conclusion at this point in time is a guarantee. I think, like, maybe the debates are going to have an impact in some way. I don't know. But what I do know is that I feel less and less certain about Biden's victory as time goes on. The more Biden speaks, the more it seems like his numbers drop. But more important than that even is the fact that Donald Trump is seemingly getting a hold of the narrative. He's blaming Joe Biden for the protests and the riots when Joe Biden doesn't even have power yet. The fact that he's able to do that shows you how effective the right-wing media machine is at manipulating and brainwashing people. Like, I don't like Joe Biden, but is he responsible for the protests? No, of course not. Now, on top of that, as COVID numbers decrease, this is good for Donald Trump because he gets rewarded for it regardless if he deserves that or not. Like, COVID is still a really, really horrible phenomenon that's taking place. But so long as the numbers are decreasing even a little bit, Trump is going to brag. Trump is going to make sure people know he's responsible. It's because of things that he did. He was the one who took action. It's not just happening on its own. He did it. It's not the governors, it's Trump. He's really good at bragging. So we don't know. Trump could still get tripped up by hyper-focusing on socialism and calling Joe Biden the far left. I think that the more he does this, the more he loses people because nobody believes that Joe Biden is far left. Unless you're a Trump supporter, then you're just, from that perspective, maybe you're too far gone anyway. But this isn't going to persuade anyone. But the key issue here is voter apathy. I think this will be the ultimate decider. Like, Trump can tweak his campaign strategy a little bit, but at the end of the day, I think this was always going to come down to enthusiasm. Democrats are going to lose unless they get out enough people to vote. And that means they have to give people a reason. They have to excite people. Have they done that? Not at all. They haven't even tried. You can say, oh, well, you know, he did these task forces with Bernie, so, I mean, are you not happy? Ask yourself this. What has he done to promote the findings of the task forces. Does anyone feel like this was more than just window dressing? I mean, if you honestly think it's going to be conducive to any policy outcomes that, you know, aren't already like going to be what he promotes, then I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Joe Biden isn't doing anything to win over voters. Like I've said, he has to pick a single policy and just talk about it endlessly Medicare for all, pot legalization, but I've even been more kind than that and said, if he just takes one of his existing policies, sorry, just hit the microphone. If he takes one of his existing policies and he just like boasts about it nonstop, $15 minimum wage, that's a winning ticket. Like if you tell people, vote for me and you're going to get a raise, that would be so influential. People who aren't excited about Joe Biden might be motivated to come out and vote because a $15 minimum wage that would be a lifesaver, a game changer to people. So even all of the supposedly progressive elements of Biden's platform, why aren't we hearing about them? Like the same thing was said back in 2016. Hillary Clinton has the most progressive platform of any Democratic nominee. Okay, well, people don't believe her, but even if that's the case, why isn't she talking about it more? So here's the thing. It's not too late for Joe Biden and Democrats to turn this around. It's not too late. But if you think that enough people doing grassroots activism on behalf of Joe Biden is going to be, you know, the, the thing that actually tips this in Biden's favor, I'm not that optimistic. It would help, sure. But I mean, Trump is already out canvassing Joe Biden. 
a couple of weeks back, I read a Politico story where they talk about how in one week, Trump's team knocked on a million doors, whereas Biden's team knocked on zero. There's already that enthusiasm there, which translates to grassroots momentum. People are canvassing and actively promoting Donald Trump. You're not just going to snap your fingers and get that because people are afraid that Trump is going to win again. Like, Biden has to do something to motivate the people to want to motivate others. Like, he's going to be the spark. He's the catalyst here. And we have to acknowledge that. But I mean, again, it's not too late to turn it around. Like, it doesn't have to be another 2016. Trump can still be ousted. We all want that to happen. But it's not going to happen if Joe Biden sits on his ass. Like, I get that I've said seemingly contradictory so admittedly that he has to hide in his basement because he keeps making gaffes but here's the thing you can have your team put on an ad that just says if you vote for me you get a raise every american gets a raise 15 dollars an hour minimum wage that's going to be my first legislative priority i mean the difference that that would make without actually endorsing any new policy would be substantial like you have to tell people I'm going to give you something if you vote for me. A tangible difference will be noticed if I'm president in your life. Your wallet will be fatter. Vote for me. I mean, Kamala Harris endorsed a $2,000 per month UBI for the duration of this pandemic. Like, is he promoting that? Is she promoting that? I mean, they just think that this victory is a given. And I see the same hubris that I saw back in 2016, except I bought into the hubris. I believed them when they were confident. This time, not so much. I don't believe that the Democrat is going to win because Trump is a clown. No, this is about what you're going to do for people. And it doesn't matter how clownish the Republican is. If people don't feel as if they have a good enough reason to come out and vote for you, if they don't know what your policies are, they're going to stay home. And if they stay home, you lose. I'll be the first to admit that I know nothing about sports. Um, I don't follow sports anymore. Like I used to watch basketball as a kid, but I don't anymore. I'm more of a video game nerd, but that's that's fine. Like the people who I know who are left wingers who follow sports, they seem to think that this NBA strike that was starting to emerge could have been something that was really substantial. However, whatever potential was there for social change, um, it was crushed by Obama. He stepped in and stopped that momentum. SB Nation reports how Barack Obama helped convince NBA players to end their strike and return to play. In a call with Chris Paul and LeBron James, Barack Obama urged NBA players to return to the court and resume the playoffs. So you don't really have to know much about sports to understand what's happening here. NBA players were planning on doing a really meaningful protest to speak out against police brutality and Obama came in and stopped it. As Ricky O'Donnell explains, a call to Barack Obama from a small group of players, including NBA PA President Chris Paul and Los Angeles Lakers superstar LeBron James, helped convince NBA players to end their strike in the wake of the police shooting of Jacob Blake and return to the court to finish the playoffs. The season was hanging in the balance when James and Paul spoke to Obama after a tense meeting between players, coaches, and union leadership on Wednesday night, followed by the Milwaukee Bucks players' decision to refuse to take the court and players from subsequent teams joining them. After no games on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the league will return to play on Saturday despite a faction of players favoring leaving the bubble and ending the season. Bucks players took inspired collective action when they decided to not play as a way to protest the police shooting of Blake. Blake, a black man, was shot by police seven times in front of his children in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just 35 miles from the Bucks home arena. Several NBA players had hinted at potentially striking, including Milwaukee's George Hill Hill, who said, we shouldn't even have came to this damn place, to be honest, a day earlier, but the move still reportedly came as a surprise to the rest of the league. The Bucks' intention was to forfeit and accept a Game 5 loss in their series against the Orlando Magic, according to Chris Haynes of Yahoo Sports. Instead, the Magic refused to accept the win, and players from the four other teams scheduled to play Wednesday night, the Oklahoma City Thunder vs. Houston Rockets and the Lakers vs. Portland Trailblazers, decided to strike in solidarity with the Bucks, NBA players then came together for a heated meeting on Wednesday night that also included union boss Michelle Roberts and coaches. There was reportedly some momentum among a certain group of players to walk away from the season as a way to pressure NBA owners to take meaningful political action towards ending police brutality and the disproportionate use of deadly force by cops against black men and women. 
Roberts reportedly helped explain how much money could be lost for NBA players if they walked away. At one point in the meeting, James and the Lakers reportedly got up and left with an apparent but unofficial vote to end the season. The Clippers followed them. At that point, it was unclear if the season was actually over. Hours later, James and Paul spoke to Obama on the phone. With the season apparently hanging in the balance, Obama helped convince NBA players to return to the court. Obama reportedly advised NBA players to play, according to Shams Sharania of The Athletic. So in case you're not keeping track, that is two major social movements that Obama decided to kill in a year. Burning 2020, and now the NBA strike. Thanks, Obama. Now, um, if you're wondering what he said to them to convince them to um, not strike, basically it was lip service. Like he convinced them that a meaningless thing is going to suffice in lieu of the strike. Katie Hill, a spokeswoman for Obama, gave the following statement to CNN. As an avid basketball fan, President Obama speaks regularly with players and league officials. When asked, he was happy to provide advice on Wednesday night to a small group of NBA players seeking to leverage their immense platforms for good after their brave and inspiring strike in the wake of Jacob Blake's shooting. They discussed establishing a social justice committee to ensure that the players and the league's actions this week led to sustained, meaningful engagement on criminal justice and police reform. Ah, so there it is. They get a committee so they can stay engaged about this issue liberals sure do love their committees and we know why like it's a way to get people to think that they're going to take action without actually accomplishing anything meaningful at all yeah so um before i give you my thoughts on this i think that this tweet Put it best, Obama just hides in one of his mansions until he senses structural change in the air and immediately gets on the phone to make sure it doesn't happen. And that is exactly right. Now, I'd be remiss to not share this meme with you because it is uh, it's pretty accurate given the circumstances that we are learning about here. So listen, I've said this once, I'll say it again. Obama is the final boss of liberalism and as long as he has credibility, the left has no chance of actually accomplishing social change. Because look at how easily he got Democrats to fall in line behind Joe Biden. You had Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, and uh, also Beto O'Rourke all come out to support Joe Biden after he won South Carolina. And more importantly, they dropped out. Had they not dropped out, centrists probably would have split the votes. Bernie would have gotten the most out of Super Tuesday. Wouldn't have been in a hole. Now, I maintain, still till this day, that, you know, it wasn't over for Bernie at that point, but was it one of the final nails in the coffin of Bernie 2020? Yeah, and Bernie just didn't act quick enough. So, you know, if you're going to blame Obama for Bernie's loss, you're not necessarily wrong. Like, I place blame on Bernie disproportionately, but still, Obama got all the centrists to coalesce around Joe Biden, something that the Republican Party establishment couldn't do in 2016, which led to Donald Trump winning. So Obama stopped that massive social movement from happening in March, and he just stopped another massive social movement from happening. Like, I don't follow sports, so I don't necessarily know how substantial this is on like a real concrete level, because all of this, you know, is uh, it's a little bit hard to follow, but if they didn't play their games, even I can acknowledge that would be huge. You get people to acknowledge the severity of this issue and the urgency to address it. But Obama just told them, all we need is a committee and that'll help us to stay engaged. Okay, well, if you stay engaged, but there's no action, then what's the point? Listen, every single time Obama is trending or gives a speech, it is incumbent on us left-wingers to educate people about his terrible legacy. He murdered innocent civilians in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. And he gave children PTSD for the rest of their lives. We elected him because he was against the Iraq war. And after having two terms, we're still in the Middle East. This is a bad person. He killed the public option, not Republicans. He didn't even propose it. He is the Grim Reaper of left-wing change. 
But so long as people worship Obama and think that he, you know, had a scandal-free administration and the biggest scandal was him wearing a tan suit, we're going to be in this predicament to where any time there is structural change in the air, as that tweet pointed out, he's going to swoop in and kill it with a phone call. Why? Because he is very persuasive. Like, if you watched his DNC convention speech, it was the best speech out of the entire convention. Like, you know exactly why he's able to convince these people to do what he wants because he's extremely charismatic. It doesn't matter that we know he's hypocritical. Most people still fall for his bullshit. Even Michael Moore, who knows better, tweeted out, you've got to love Obama. Really, Michael? You've got to love Obama? The guy who easily killed Bernie 2020 and droned innocent civilians in the Middle East and North Africa? You got to love that guy? No, you don't. And you shouldn't. So this is disgusting. Obama is just another smug, rich elite that now is an obstacle to change that we have to fight once again. Like, I absolutely regret voting for him twice. Like, I was stupid enough to believe that, you know, maybe in his second term it'd be better. It was really the Republicans who were holding him back. No, we know who Obama is. He's another Clinton Democrat. But except... Maybe worse than Clinton at this point because Clinton doesn't have much credibility, whereas Obama does have leg legitimacy. So if he says something, people listen, especially Democrats and centrists and the media. They love him. So, yeah, you think that, you know, in four years or eight years, AOC is going to easily, you know, sweep to victory in a Democratic primary? Not if Obama has anything to say about it. You think if we elect enough justice Democrats, we're going to get Medicare for all passed? Not if Obama swoops in and gives them a call. He's the enemy to change. He's an obstacle to change that we have to fight. Again, final boss of liberalism. So unless we work in overtime to discredit Obama, nothing is going to change in this country. Myself, as well as most of my viewers, like if Joe Biden wins, I don't think any of us are expecting like structural change or systematic reforms that would actually meaningfully change this country for the better. But at a minimum, I think most of us assume that he's going to handle COVID-19 at least better than Donald Trump. I mean, you can't really do a worse job than Donald Trump unless you try. Like, Donald Trump has fumbled this in a way that's comical. Like, we've handled COVID-19 in a way that a failed state would have handled COVID-19. Like, we are doing worse than any other developed country for the most part. And it's just, it's shocking to me. But now, as the polls kind of tilt more towards Donald Trump's favor... As Joe Biden starts to lose ground against Trump in key battle states, I'm questioning, okay, if Trump is reelected, worst case scenario, what can we expect with regard to COVID if we have the same child handling COVID-19? And we have a new story that tells us we can expect the worst case scenario where we deal with COVID-19 probably for another four years unless it just like organically goes away because the strategy that Donald Trump is already looking at it's a disaster. So as Yasmin Abutalib and Josh Dossie of the Washington Post report, one of President Trump's top medical advisors is urging the White House to embrace a controversial herd immunity strategy to combat the pandemic, which would entail allowing the coronavirus to spread through most of the population to quickly build resistance to the virus while taking steps to protect those in nursing homes and other vulnerable populations, according to five people familiar with the discussions. The administration has already already begun to implement some policies along these lines, according to current and former officials, as well as experts, particularly with regard to testing. The approach's chief proponent is Scott Atlas, a neuroradiologist from Stanford's conservative Hoover Institution, who joined the White House earlier this month as a pandemic advisor. He has advocated that the United States adopt the model Sweden has used to respond to the virus outbreak, according to these officials, which relies on lifting restrictions so the healthy can build up immunity to the disease rather than limiting social and business interactions to prevent the virus from spreading. Sweden's handling of the pandemic has been heavily criticized by public health officials and infectious disease experts as reckless. The country has among the highest infection and death rates in the world. It also hasn't escaped the deep economic problems resulting from the pandemic, but Sweden's approach has gained support among some conservatives who argue that social distancing restrictions are crushing the economy and infringing 
infringing on people's liberties. That this approach is even being discussed inside the White House is drawing concern from experts inside and outside the government who note that a herd immunity strategy could lead to the country suffering hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lost lives. The administration faces pretty serious hurdles in making this argument. One is a lot of people will die, even if you can protect people in nursing homes, said Paul Romer, a professor at New York University who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2018. Once it's out in the community, we've seen over and over again, it ends up spreading everywhere. So, I mean, after reading this, uh, we can expect... Four more years of COVID-19 if we get four more years of Donald Trump because he's going to handle this in the most irresponsible way possible because he thinks that if we just pretend like this isn't a thing, if we opt for the herd immunity strategy, well then, I mean, at least the economy will be saved, right? But except if you're going to copy Sweden, understand that they still didn't save their economy. Like, that's very obvious, right? You can't just choose between sacrificing, you know, the economy and people. Like, this isn't a real choice. That's a false dichotomy. Like, you don't get to choose to save the economy by sacrificing people because if you end up sacrificing people, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to save the economy. But, I mean, it's worth it to take the chance if you're Donald Trump because that makes you look better. And, look, if we're going to copy anything from Sweden, why aren't we copying their healthcare system? Like, we copied the worst elements about other countries, but never the best elements. And from what I've understood, herd immunity might not even be a possibility because people who get infected with the virus are susceptible to reinfection if their bodies don't produce a sizable enough antibody response. We don't know yet because information is, you know, still scarce and we're learning more and more. So that might not even be a thing. Like, people might not be able to just build up an, an immunity. Like, we might actually need uh, a vaccine, we might actually need to make sure we social distance and we don't reopen the economy. We stay home as much as possible until it just goes away. But of course, it doesn't matter. Like, whatever is the most reckless strategy, that's what Donald Trump is going to pursue. So the fact that Donald Trump, at this point, when he sees how deadly COVID-19 is, is even considering herd immunity as a strategy, I mean, it just goes to show you what to expect if he's reelected. This it's going to stay with us for a long time because he just wants it to wash over the country. Like that original thing that he asked his advisors about, that's a thing. I guess we're back to people hoping that America just grows numb to the COVID-19 deaths in his administration. Like that's what they were saying before. They were reportedly saying, man, I really hope that people just grow numb to all of this because it's making us look pretty bad. We're back to that mentality. We're back to reopen everything. I mean, this is depressing, right? I hate Joe Biden. I know that we're not going to get any change that we need that would stop the rise of another demagogue like Donald Trump, but I don't think he would opt for herd immunity, right? So, I mean, that is something to consider. Four more years of Donald Trump means we're dealing with COVID-19 for the foreseeable future. Until we get an actual vaccine that really works, that's effective, or, you know, we learn that herd immunity is even a possibility, that people do have permanent immunity to COVID-19 after they get it. Then you just need a certain amount of people to reach immunity status to get herd immunity. I don't know what the number is in particular because obviously I'm not an epidemiologist or an expert, but it's just we're looking at the worst case scenario if Trump is reelected. And the fact that he's even considering this, the fact that he is not like personally, you know, grief stricken by almost 185,000 Americans dying, it shows you he doesn't care about the American people. He wants to reopen the economy because he cares about money and capitalism. That's what this is about. It's not some sort of, you know, thought out strategy to handle COVID-19 quickly. This is about money because we are in a late stage capitalist society. And what matters more than human life, of course, is money and capital and the economy. So if we got to sacrifice thousands more people, possibly millions of people at the altar of capitalism, that's what they're going to do here. So we've talked about how most of the individuals not taking COVID-19 seriously, who are spreading misinformation about it and refusing to wear masks, are disproportionately right-wingers. Prominent right-wing figures are the ones who are downplaying the severity of it. Um, now, maybe, it's, you know, there's some exceptions to the rule here and I'm missing some conservatives and maybe I'm being too broad in my generalization. But nonetheless, this is what I've seen. I hope that changes. But 
Uh, one example uh, to kind of demonstrate this is that one prominent conservative is uh, downplaying the severity of COVID-19 after it killed him. Yeah, I'm talking about Herman Cain because the official Twitter account for Herman Cain tweeted out an article with the headline which says, CDC now says 94% of COVID deaths had underlying condition and adds, it looks like the virus is not as deadly as the mainstream media first made it out to be. Herman Cain died from COVID-19. And his account is tweeting out this garbage. Right-wingers are just ruthless and they are relentless, and they stick to a narrative, no matter how deadly that narrative is. I mean, you'd think that this account of all wouldn't want to spread this sort of message, downplay the severity of COVID-19, but they're still doing it. And this is kind of disgusting. Is this what Herman Cain would want? Like, we don't know what he wants. We know that he didn't take it seriously and killed him. But would he have a change of tune after actually dying from it? Probably. So maybe don't tweet this out on his behalf when you don't know what you're talking about. Like, if the CDC says that 94% of COVID deaths had underlying condition, that doesn't necessarily mean automatically that it's not as serious as it is in actuality because you don't know what you're talking about. But this account is apparently now the Kane Gang. They've rebranded. So they're just taking this platform that Herman Cain built and they're using it to spread misinformation and downplay the severity of COVID-19 to the detriment of America. Classy. Now, that headline that they shared is pretty misleading. Um, but if you think that that means you should take COVID-19 less seriously, please don't because it is serious and that's not the case. So Rebecca Falkner of Axios basically put out a fact sheet explaining that statistic. So she says a new Centers for Disease Control report shows 94% of people who died from COVID-19 in the United States had contributing health conditions. Yes, but Australian epidemiologist Gideon Meyerowitz Katz noted in a blog post on Monday that the CDC estimates COVID-19 was the underlying cause of 95% of all deaths related to the virus. Only in 5% of deaths has it been listed as a contributing cause. This report doesn't mean that COVID isn't as bad as we thought. It's clear from the CDC's statistics on excess deaths that more people are dying than usual because of COVID. The fact that common pre-existing medical conditions Conditions often coincide with deadly coronavirus infections is part of what makes it scary, not a reason to write it off. Twitter removed a post earlier Sunday retweeted by President Trump for violating its rules with a false interpretation of the CDC's novel coronavirus data. The post incorrectly claimed the CDC had quietly updated its data to admit that only 6% of those listed in the U.S. coronavirus death toll actually died from COVID and that the other 94% had two to three other serious illnesses, CNN notes. The post by a supporter of a baseless conspiracy theory has since been deleted. Reality check. While the cause of death listed as solely from the coronavirus occurred in 6% of cases in the U.S. from February 1st to August 22nd, this doesn't mean that the virus was not a contributing factor or, indeed, the leading cause in the other 94%. The U.S. virus death toll would be much lower if this were the case. It's well established that people with underlying medical conditions are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. People can live with obesity, diabetes, or heart disease for years but get infected with COVID-19 and die quickly, CNN points out. For the record, the deaths with conditions or causes as well as COVID-19 on average were 2.6 additional conditions or causes per death according to the CDC. Now, this is what the CDC lists as underlying medical conditions that led to coronavirus deaths. They say influenza and pneumonia, respiratory failure, hypertensive disease, diabetes, vascular and unspecified dementia, cardiac arrest, heart failure, renal failure, intentional and unintentional injury, poisoning, and other adverse effects. Now, honestly, I'm confused at what portion of the data Trump is trying to misrepresent, because if COVID-19 leads to respiratory failure in someone, but respiratory failure itself is ultimately what killed them, should that not count towards the COVID-19 death? If COVID-19 is what caused them to have 
respiratory failure. I mean, what are we trying to misrepresent here? All I know is that Donald Trump is trying to make himself look good. Now, I'm not going to suggest that like all conservatives are going to believe this misinformation or even spread it, but I get that like some of them, they're not just trying to spread this at the behest of Donald Trump. If they are in fact doing that, maybe they just want to believe that this isn't as bad because it's really, it's scary, right? But all I know is that this is very serious and we have to take it seriously and we are still learning more and more. So it's really unhelpful for large accounts, people with large followings, to spread misinformation about this or downplay the severity of COVID-19. We're approaching 185,000 deaths from COVID-19. 185,000. If you're not taking it seriously, then I don't know what to say. You're hurting everyone because if you don't take it seriously and you act carelessly, then you help spread the virus. You help make it so that way we have to be in this state of lockdown constantly. We all want this to be over. Like, do they honestly believe that like the left is like yearning for an economic lockdown or they're yearning for COVID-19 to still be a thing and kill lots of Americans so it can help like Joe Biden? Like, I'm trying to figure out if they honestly believe that the left... And even Democrats, centrists, want this to be a thing for political reasons. That's not the case. I don't believe that anyone is looking at like the political benefits of COVID-19 or how this helps people politically or hurts Donald Trump. Like, I don't care. If we can get rid of COVID-19 like that, even knowing it helped Donald Trump, I would opt for that option because that means that we would save lives. Less people would die and be sick and suffer. Not everyone is as politically calculated as you might want to think. But I mean, to spread all of this, it's either irresponsible or wishful thinking that this isn't as serious. But I mean, it is serious. You do need to take it seriously. And again, we are still learning more about this virus. So, I mean, I'll leave that there. It's really disgusting that the people who are running Herman Cain's account are still downplaying the severity of COVID-19 after it killed the person whose account they run. Like, how disgusting of a person do you have to be to still do something like this after it took his life? I bet if he were here to talk about this, he'd say, it's pretty damn serious. It's not just the media phenomenon. It's not just sensationalism. Sure, you can say that some elements of it maybe are sensationalistic, but that's not really my main critique. My main critique with regard to COVID-19 is how Donald Trump and our American political system have failed us, handled this virus like a failed state. Not given any economic relief to American citizens. Tried to reopen as quickly as possible and pretend like it's not a thing because that's better for the economy. That's my critique. My critique in this instance isn't necessarily from the media. Like, they kind of get a pass because they haven't been part of the problem. Right-wing media has been part of the problem. Fox News has been part of the problem when you have people like Tucker Carlson promote quacks who cite skewed data trying to prove that COVID-19 isn't that serious. Like, he did this in the beginning. Like, can we just stop this? COVID-19, like it or not, isn't a partisan issue. Viruses don't have political preferences. So let's treat it like the threat to us that it is and try to learn more about it and not spread... Uh, you know, misinformation, whether that's for political reasons or just due to wishful thinking. Like, let's stop. Let's be more responsible when we're talking about COVID-19, especially if we're not experts. We all just watched the RNC convention not too long ago. And if you tuned in, you probably realized that there was zero substance, no policies offered, no solutions proposed, just fear mongering. Be afraid of socialism. Be afraid of Black Lives Matter protesters. Be afraid of Cori Bush. Be afraid of everything. Vote for us and we'll protect you from all of these really scary things in the world. I mean, this is what you come to expect from the Republican Party. But it's interesting because Steve Hilton of Fox News, he gave me the impression that he was expecting something a little bit different. Because after the DNC's convention, he, you know, I think rightfully called them out for having not much substance, just using platitudes and cliches. I agree with that. But he was given an exclusive sneak peek at Donald Trump's second term and some of the policies that Donald Trump will be pursuing. He says it was bursting with ideas. Bursting with ideas. Never something that I would associate with the Republican Party. Now, even his optimism here is misguided because the policies that he's so excited about aren't that substantive, aren't that fresh or innovative. But yet, 
He's excited about this because, of course, he's a hack. And after calling the DNC convention a substance-free event, you know, I'm now curious to know what he thinks about the RNC convention after watching it, thinking that, you know, there's going to be these types of policies. So we'll, we'll look at the preview that Trump gave to him prior to the RNC convention, and we'll see if we could keep track how many fresh and exciting ideas are being proposed by Donald Trump if he gets a second term. Our exclusive look at the Trump second term agenda. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago, I asked of the Trump campaign, where's the energy? Where are the ideas for the future? Well, with this new policy plan, they've answered those questions and then some. After talking to President Trump and seeing these plans, it seems to me that the president and his team are bursting with ideas to move the country forward. Concrete plans, not the vague platitudes we heard last week, which themselves were completely overshadowed by the non-stop negativity of the Democrats' doom and gloom convention. Because the Democrats and their media allies are so consumed by hate for Trump and his supporters, they think that all they have to do to win is lie hysterically about Trump and scream about systemic this and structural that. No. People want to know what you're going to do for them. Specific, practical things, not just esoteric academic concepts. And here's what the Trump campaign is promising to do for you and this country in a second term. The plan is called Fighting For You. The best is yet to come. There are 50 commitments in 10 categories, including jobs, ending our reliance on China, drain the swamp, defend our police, end illegal immigration and protect our workers, and innovate for the future. One of the categories is eradicate COVID-19. And in fact, there was important progress towards that end just this afternoon with the president's announcement of FDA authorization for the use of convalescent plasma as a therapeutic. This is a uh, powerful therapy that transfuses very, very strong antibodies from the blood of recovered patients to help treat patients battling a current infection. It's had an incredible rate of success. In the weeks ahead, we'll take you through all the key policies in this document and show you the contrast between this and the Biden-Bernie Sanders platform. But for now, here are a few specific highlights. Tax credits for companies that bring manufacturing jobs back from China, with a target of a million jobs returning. Providing school choice to every child in America. Exposing Washington's money trail and delegating powers back to the people and the states, one I particularly love. Winning the race for 5G, and establishing a national high-speed internet network. There is so much more. Exactly what we wanted to see. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't even keep track of all of the fresh and exciting ideas that we should have expected from Republicans. <laughs> I don't know what you expected. I don't know what you expected. Now, again, keep in mind, this was filmed before the RNC convention. So um, he thought that maybe some of these policies would be on display at the RNC event, but of course, you know, it was nothing. It was nonstop fear mongering. But yet, in that same clip, he criticized uh, the Democratic Party for doom and gloom and nonstop negativity. I am really curious to know what you thought of the RNC convention now. By the time I film this, like his reaction is probably up. So uh, we'll have to follow up. But um, even the policies that you're really excited about, they're not good. These are mostly amorphous right-wing talking points that don't actually help people. Because again, Republicans don't actually care about helping people. Their agenda is very unpopular. They are a minority party that gets power because they convince rubes to vote for them, even if they're going to cut environmental regulations and give tax cuts to the wealthy, because they convince these people that they're going to protect them from all of the boogeymans. Now, that boogeyman will change depending on the political context. So it might be immigrants, it might be MS-13, it could be Antifa protesters, but there's always some boogeyman and Republicans win by convincing enough people that they're going to stop the big bad boogeyman. But Steve Hilton thought that that would be different at the RNC convention, and he was excited based on this. So, basically, he lays out six categories. This is what Donald Trump gave to him, and these are broad categories about what Trump will be pursuing in his second term. The only one that even remotely touches on normal Americans and impacts them in a concrete way is jobs. Now, we don't know what Trump's plan is in particular. More jobs, I guess, is good, theoretically speaking. People want that. 
But the question is, what do we mean by that? If Trump is just vaguely promising more jobs, does that mean we also get protections for workers? Do we get an increase in the minimum wage? Or do we get more shitty jobs where people are working longer hours for lower wages? Like, this isn't necessarily a good thing unless you're proposing things related to jobs, like protections for workers, increased wages, pensions, drain the swamp. I mean, does anyone believe that Donald Trump is going to quote unquote drain the swamp after his own family is personally profiting off of his presidency? I mean, how can you with a straight face think Trump is going to address corruption in a meaningful way when he's one of the most corrupt presidents in American history? Certainly the most corrupt since Nixon. And I mean, like the rest of these points here that he brings up, these are all just, again, vague right-wing talking points. They have no real bearing on the quality of people's lives. But then, uh, not on that list of six categories, was uh, Trump is proposing the complete eradication of COVID-19. Oh, well, geez, why didn't you just say that earlier? Wow, how innovative. Trump wants to get rid of COVID-19. This is something that only Trump is proposing. Joe Biden isn't proposing the eradication of COVID-19. Like, how are we excited about this or supposed to get excited about this? after Donald Trump completely fucked up COVID-19 and his response to it and continues to lie about COVID-19 and spread misinformation. Like, is this honestly something that you think people are going to get excited about when Donald Trump already proved that he's incapable of handling a pandemic? Like, what are you, what are you doing? After nearly 185,000 Americans have died because of Trump's incompetence, I mean, who thinks Trump is going to handle COVID-19 like an adult. Now, he does share Trump promoting the FDA's authorization to use convalescent plasma for treatment. But how is that a game changer? The FDA will exist with or without Trump, and they'd still use that as a treatment. Do we think that that wouldn't be a thing if Joe Biden was president? Like, how is this a Trump-specific thing that we should be excited about? Like, why would we vote for Trump because of this? Like, you have nothing. You're grasping at straws. But he does get into some specifics. So, he wants to bring back 1 million manufacturing jobs from China and offer tax credits for companies that bring back jobs from China. Okay, this is specific at least. I give him credit for that. But why do large multinational corporations need even more tax cuts? Because I thought that the 2017 tax law already promoted investment in the United States. Like, what happened? Why did they need more tax cuts? Why couldn't Trump get this pulled off in his first term? I mean, what a joke. Uh, on top of that, provide school choice to every child in America. Oh, goody. So we'll defund public education and promote charter schools so Donald Trump's donors and his education secretary can make lots of money. How exciting. What a phenomenal policy. I mean, he's right. This is going to impact people in a concrete way, but not in a good way. Destroying public education to promote for-profit schools is not a good thing. But at least it's all policy. On top of that, expose Washington's money trail and delegate powers back to the people and the states. I don't even know what this means, but you don't get to claim that Trump or Republicans are in favor of states' rights after he literally just threatened to subvert the will of governors and send the National Guard and the military to states to violently crush protests. Like, that isn't a thing you get to say, and then also say that you're in favor of states' rights. It's one or the other, pick one. And if we're talking about a money trail in Washington, if that doesn't include Donald Trump and his own business dealings, then I'm not interested. Uh, also, win the race to 5G and establish a national high-speed wireless internet network. Now, first of all, 5G is a technological advance that is going to happen regardless of who's president, so that doesn't matter. And if Steve Hilton is suggesting that Trump is going to establish some type of public option for the internet, I'm going to have to doubt that. I think probably what this means is uh, just make sure that people have access to national high speed but when you say national like when you use that word you imply that there's going to be like a public option for internet so rather than using comcast i can buy like government sponsored internet is that a thing i don't think that's what trump is proposing and if that's not the case like if i'm if i'm correct and trump isn't actually proposing that then what's the promise here we get 5g which was inevitable anyway and high speed internet i mean these private companies are already trying to increase infrastructure to get high-speed internet to more areas. So, like, what what promise here is related specifically to Donald Trump? Why would we only get this if Trump is president and not Joe Biden? So, do you understand, like, even the things that you're excited about, this is not substantive. This is not meaningful. This is not going to help people. And here's the thing. Just having policies 
that's not good enough. They have to be good policies. They have to be policies that actually help people. Like if you propose a policy like private charter schools, that in and of itself, because it's a policy, isn't just inherently good. You need policies that help people, objectively help people. This is not good public policy. So, I mean, it's funny because he criticized the Democrats because they had no substance, just platitudes. But I bet, I guarantee, in fact, that he's going to have a little bit different of a narrative when he talks about the RNC convention. Like, it's not like he's going to say, wow, I was really excited for all of these policies and then the RNC let me down. Like, I highly doubt that. I'd eat this microphone if that happened. But, I mean, this is a hack. This is a propagandist. And he knows what he has to do. You get on camera every single day and you say exactly what the RNC wants you to say like a good little stooge. And you pretend to be excited about it. Now, maybe he drank the Kool-Aid. But either way, he knows his role. And he should be embarrassed because this... um exclusive look at Trump's policy priorities for his second term. Does anyone think that the Republican Party is bursting with ideas, as he said? Well, if you think that, you're a rube. But I think that people know what they're getting when they vote Republicans. They know the environment is going to be destroyed faster than as if a Democrat were president. They're going to cut uh, regulations. Donald Trump deregulated uh, a lot, and that led to the, uh, what was it, the, was it salmonella or E. coli outbreak with lettuce? That happened in 2017, like, that's so far back now that I can't even remember, but this is what happens when you get deregulation, like, people know about this, like, people know Republicans don't support Medicare for All or anything that helps them, they just are hateful, and they've been duped to believe that there's a lot of boogeymen that Trump is gonna protect us from, so they know what they're getting, don't pretend like Republicans have some fresh, innovative perspective that they're bringing to politics. Give me a fucking break. Like, you know better than this, Steve. Come on. The Republican convention was positive, substantive, inclusive. Real policies helping real people. <laughs> <laughs> So-called right-wing populist Sagar Anjeti, who is a co-host on The Hill Rising with Crystal Ball, recently had a piping hot take that kind of proves why the left is right to question both the authenticity and existence altogether of this phenomenon supposedly known as right-wing populism. Because if you believe what he tweeted he believes, then you're no populist. So he states, Today, a riser posted a story of himself smoking weed and watching rising. It greatly distressed me. So to counteract it, I'm asking that other risers post Insta stories doing literally anything else while watching the show. I will repost them all. What? <laughs> Why did somebody smoking weed distress you? It distressed you so much that you're willing to to post anything else instead of them smoking weed? So is snorting coke okay? What if they, you know, take a picture of themselves eating a turd? Would you, um, would you share that? We don't need to go any further because I'm just going to dive into like really gross analogies. <laughs> but you get the point. Like, are you being serious? I genuinely don't know if he's trolling. Um, if he is, then I stand corrected. I'm wrong. You know, um, you fooled me, sir. Good job. Well played. But like, is he being serious though? Because he is a conservative and conservatives are most likely to not support pot legalization or the use of marijuana. Although I will say that even if that's the case, even if they're more likely to not support weed, uh, still a majority of conservatives support the legalization of marijuana. In fact, 67% of Americans, two thirds of the country support legal weed. And that includes a majority of people in every single demographic. And yes, I mean a majority and not a plurality. And that even includes Republicans, like I alluded to earlier, 55% of which say pot should be legal. This is very popular. So if you are against something that's popular, then by definition, you're not a populist. If you're falling for antiquated reefer madness hysteria, you're not a populist. You're just a standard conservative or a corporate Democrat. So, I mean, part of me thinks that, like, he's not being serious because it's so 
absurd to think that someone who's younger would be against pot legalization regardless if they are a Republican or a Democrat or independent. Like, to be against it is so inconceivable to me that I have to think that you're trolling. But, I mean, up until this point, we don't know if he's being serious or not. But, I mean, the fact that he put this out there, you have to assume that he is being serious. I mean, he's not known for being a big troll, unless I'm missing that. But, like, if you honestly are concerned with pot... I mean, you're proving right-wing populism is a farce. Like, it's already difficult to believe that right-wing populism is a thing because traditionally, like, I don't really view populism as being attached to the left or the right. It's just a politician that supports someone uh, or supports policies that are popular. Um, not necessarily just a, po a politician, but like people. So, I mean, the fact that you attach that right-wing qualifier to it doesn't really make sense. Um, but I mean, if you are going to be in support of populist policies, then how could you be conservative? Because everything that's popular currently is against conservatism. I mean, do you want to raise the minimum wage? Do you support Medicare for all? If you do, then great. But I mean, to be a right-wing populist, that seems like an oxymoron. So, um, yeah, I genuinely don't know if he's trolling. I don't know the fact that I'm not sure that shows you why conservatives like are so unpopular why they're not populist because we should know that you support pot legalization and promote the use of pot if you're a populist because it's harmless there's nothing wrong with it but because i'm talking about this um of course i'm going to share my uh satirical propaganda piece that i put out a couple of years ago it didn't get nearly as much attention as it deserved so whenever i talk about this story i feel inclined to share it because i think that people need to see this because i worked hard on it and i i think it's it's good it's objectively good so it's a little bit outdated but i think it's still relevant you know for politicians who are against pot legalization so i will leave you with my uh truth about marijuana propaganda piece that's supposed to be you know a parody of all of this hysteria against marijuana since the dawn of time Mankind has been plagued by war, poverty, and natural disasters. But nothing can compare to the most destructive force in the world, marijuana. Legalization of marijuana for tax purposes, and, and that's the only way people justify because you can't justify it any other way, it's blood money. I mean, people on pot that shoot each other, they're, that they're, stab they're, they're each other, strangle each brain, other, drive families. under the influence, kill families, wipe out a whole family. Marijuana leads to doing worse things. That's just a fact. I don't care what anybody says, what the debate is. The only reason you use weed outside of a medical situation is to intoxicate yourself. But we also have anecdotal evidence now from Colorado where some of the people who were um, taking uh, marijuana for those purposes, um, the coroner uh, believes after they died there was drug interactions with other things they were taking. Even a single marijuana can be deadly. The liberal media hides the truth about marijuana, arguing it's safer than alcohol and cigarettes. But even just one marijuana can tear apart families. All right, I'll, I'll get straight to the point. I found marijuana in the house. lead to death, or worse, cause homosexuality. Those that know the truth are laughed at. So what we have here is a case of money over morality. And you know, right now, it's, it's really funny. Folks, we're watching the, the chuckleheads, you know, we're watching these uh, folks doing what they're doing out there and getting a good laugh about it. But when the body count starts rising, when people start dying, then maybe, yeah, yeah it's real funny, isn't it? Real funny, real funny to talk about. Meanwhile, People are dying. This man died after taking just one marijuana. His friends told him it was safe because they heard it from liberal cucks like T.J. Kirk, Secular Talk, and The Humanist Report. We must stop the marijuana epidemic now, and you can help. Share this video with your friends. It could save a life.
I don't know about you all, but I still feel uh, demoralized and a little bit uneasy after watching the, you know, cringeworthy DNC convention and the horror show that was the RNC convention. But thankfully, on Sunday, we had a different sort of convention take place. The Movement for People's Party held their People's Convention. And this is what I want to see. It featured prominent speakers, such as the great Cornell West, Nina Turner, Marianne Williamson, Mike Gravel, and the list goes on. Um, basically, the goal of this was to bring people together to create a new People's Party, an alternative to the two-party duopoly that we see that very clearly isn't doing an adequate job at representing us. Now, 85,000 people actually signed up to support this. So it's nice to see a lot of people kind of coalesce around this one big idea of, hey, the two-party system isn't working out, so let's subvert that and create our own thing. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about the People's Party, and then I also um, want to tell you about the origins, because this is really interesting. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but this was originally the draft Bernie movement, but it has morphed into the People's Party. But before we get to that, um, this was kind of their goal. Every four years, the two major parties have held their conventions with noisy fanfare, but without any lasting and meaningful solutions to the severe challenges the American American people face, and the challenges have become more severe every year. We are building a major new party that is genuinely of, by, and for the American people, one that will truly represent us and that aims to build the stronger, healthier, and more just society we all deserve. And that, to me, sounds incredible. So, um, you know, it's inspiring to see all of these people come together and say, we agree, we want the same thing. Um, you know, and I didn't watch all of it. I didn't get to watch it live, so I'm, like, trying to catch up. But what I saw was far more substantive than the RNC and DNC conventions combined. So kudos to Nick Brown. I actually brought him on my show in, like, I think 2017 or 2018 when he was doing the draft Bernie movement. But ultimately, Bernie said no. So, you know, the movement had to go somewhere. There's still a need for an alternative to the Democratic Party. And now it is the uh, People's Party. So I'm going to share a couple of clips from some great moments. I mean, of course, I tuned in because I wanted to see Cornell West and Nina Turner speak. Um, and Marianne Williamson has quickly like risen up on my list of people who I really respect and admire, so her as well. Uh, so I'll kind of give you my highlights, my favorite moments. But um, what's interesting is that there was like almost no coverage of this in the mainstream media. When you have 85,000 people sign up for this event, like you'd think there'd be some sort of coverage, but there wasn't much. But this is what I want. I want this to not just be a thing that is created. I want it to like be viable. I want it to work. So I want to kind of extend the message of this people party. Like, and let me just say, this was like a diverse group of people, like not just demographically speaking, I'm speaking like in terms of their ideology. Some of them are voting for Joe Biden, like Cornell West, Marianne Williamson, they're going to vote for Joe Biden. So they're not saying exclusively, we only want to go the third party route. But to me, what this established was the urgent necessity for an alternative to the Democratic Party. And I think that we need this. Um, but in order for it to be successful, I want people to acknowledge that we have to put in the groundwork for this. We have to do some very specific things to make this happen. Because if we just like create a new party and we don't change the institutions, then ultimately nothing will come of it, right? Because we have third parties in this country and currently they're more successful on the right than they are on the left. Like the Libertarian Party takes more from the Republicans than, you know, the Green Party takes from Democrats. So if this were to become a thing and the party was founded and they started to like run people for Congress and whatnot, then... It would be really, really important for you to make sure that this party is viable. And the way that you do that is to push for electoral reform. And I've said this once, I will say it again. There is a bill, H.R. 4000, that will make it much easier for all of us to get a third and fourth party because it moves us away from the first past the post majoritarian winner take all system. And it institutes nationwide ranked choice voting, proportional representation. So rather than all of us just having one representative, we have two or three maybe. So it's more proportional. And on top of that, it ends gerrymandering. And if you are not able to convince your lawmaker, as I couldn't, to support this bill, then if you live in a state where you have ballot initiatives, what you can do is try to get ranked choice voting on the ballot. I mean, this happened in Maine. 
and it was a game changer. You see a prominent Green Party figure running for the U.S. Senate, right? Lisa Savage, I brought her on my program. So we want this to be accompanied by electoral reform, because if you don't get electoral reform, then this party isn't going to be viable. It's not going to be viable. Like best case scenario, you get like 10, 20 percent of people in this party, but then that's not enough to actually take power. 10 to 20 percent in each district even is not enough to actually assume power. So we have to make this party viable by getting electoral reform. That's step number one. Now, what we want is for not just third and fourth parties to become a thing in America, but we want them to be good parties, right? Because once you start to actually get power, what happens? Capitalism corrupts that institution. So let's say, best case scenario, we get the People's Party in Congress and they represent like a third of voters. Well, once you start to get power, then that attracts special interests who then try to co-opt and corrupt that new power. So even if, let's say, like the Green Party, if they actually started becoming really key players, if we got electoral reform, um, we would have to protect the uh, viability of third parties in the sense that like they don't just become extensions of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Like we'd want them to still be corporate free and represent the people. So you'd have to protect them from capitalism essentially and make sure that we get campaign finance reform. We decommodify elections. So in order for this to work, we have to do a lot of things. Like one, we need electoral reform. And two, we have to make sure that these parties don't become shitty over time and we have to get money out of politics so that way they can't be co-opted and corrupted, right? Now, if we were to get some sort of, you know, people's party, if this actually worked, which I wanted to, but we didn't get electoral reform, what would we be looking at? Well, let's say, you know, it got 10 to 20 percent. Let's go with that figure that I was using earlier of the electorate. Well, as I stated, that wouldn't be enough to actually get power in many instances, and they would just be splitting votes with Democrats, which means that Republicans would win. So that's why we desperately need electoral reform, because it's not enough to just have like a People's Party, but we need this People's Party to be viable. Like we want members of the People's Party to actually make it to Congress, right? That's the ultimate goal of this, to get power. Uh, but we have to make sure we get electoral reform and campaign finance reform. Otherwise, like, we're doing all of this for nothing. Now, there is a world where it's a possibility that, like, the People's Party just becomes big enough to where they take away a chunk of voters from Democrats, and then, you know, that forces Democrats to come to the table and try to, you know, uh, bring in the People's Party. But after seeing how stupid the Democrats are, like, in that instance, let's say, like, the People's Party was taking away like 30% of Democratic Party voters and they were losing every election. I still think that Democrats wouldn't come to the table. I think they just say, uh, you know, this People's Party is worse than Republicans because they're helping them win, yada, yada, yada. Like, we've learned that Democrats are not going to make any changes. Like, they're going to vote shame because that's better to them. That works better than actually getting ranked choice voting because if they were to promote ranked choice voting, well, then that would stop the spoilage issue that they're so concerned with. But that also threatens their power because then third and fourth parties might become viable. So, you know, I don't think Democrats will ever come to the table with any sort of third party. Um, it'd be really unlikely because they're just, they're stupid, they're dense, they've showed us that they're not going to want to do anything. So we have to make sure that we make this party viable and we don't rely on the Democratic Party to make them come to the table and meet with us and become viable because... We're going to be waiting forever. That's never going to happen. Democrats are too stupid to do anything. They don't care about winning or losing elections. So if we eat up like a sizable chunk of their electorate with the People's Party, they don't give a fuck. They don't care because then they're just going to try to fundraise more to their corporate donors. So we have to make sure that we fight for electoral reform. Now, look, I understand people are anxious and they don't want to do this crucial step of getting electoral reform. I feel you, right? Duverger's law is a thing, but it's not like a written, like codified law. It just suggests that, you know, in these more majoritarian, first-past-the-post, winner-take-all systems, most of the times you're going to see just two parties, and those parties are going to be pretty milk toast, pretty centrist in most instances. Now, this isn't like a universal thing. I mean, uh, South Africa has proportional representation. Um, their institutions actually are theoretically conducive to multiple parties, but they have like one prominent party, ANC, that wins every single time, right? Um, and even when you get electoral reform, as Japan did, 
that still might change one election or two elections, but then things kind of just go back to normal. So it's really, really tough. Now, back in 2016, I told myself, okay, listen, I think that people are just so frustrated with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. It's possible that so many people vote for the Green Party that uh, we get 5%. And that 5% leads to federal funding, right? And that makes the Green Party real players. But Jill Stein got 1%, which was baffling to me because still, even like with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump going up against each other, and you have someone like Jill Stein who's bringing ideas to the table like student debt cancellation and a Green New Deal, which are now popular in the Democratic Party, people rejected her. Because it's not just about like the institutions and majoritarian winner take all systems. Like I've learned after 2016 that like this two party duopoly, like it's something that's embedded in our DNA. Like people culturally just won't vote for anything other than the Democratic or Republican parties. They won't. Like it just, they have to pick one or the other. And even if we got electoral reform, I still don't necessarily know if we can nudge them in the correct direction. But what we can do if we got ranked choice voting is defang their arguments, right? People oftentimes who are theoretically more inclined to support a third party, they don't want to vote for a Green Party person if that means that the Democrat who's more likely to win ends up losing. So they want to stop Republicans from winning. Therefore, they vote for Democrats. That's what a lot of people do. It's called strategic voting rather than sincere voting. But if we had ranked choice voting nationwide, then we could explain to them how now it doesn't actually hurt you to vote for a Green Party candidate or a People's Party candidate. You can vote for a third party and rank your choices so if you want to vote for howie hawkins as number one that's fine you just choose joe biden as your number two and you make sure that you know you vote your heart and your conscience but the worst person who you don't want to win doesn't win like you're not enabling them by splitting votes like this is this is really important because they're not going to buy it if we just say you know hey we have a third party vote for us they like we've learned after 2016 it's going to be one of the two parties, it's the duopoly. They're not even going to try to give the Greens 5%, right? So what I want is for the People's Party to be a thing that's viable. So if you support this, and I don't know who doesn't support this, because who whoever like can't see the need for an alternative to the Democratic and Republican parties, like I, I don't get that, I don't understand you. But I think most people who are watching know that there's a need for this. We need a people's party, and I'm glad this came together. So what we have to do now is put in the groundwork. Like, this is a grassroots movement, right? This is the formation of a people's party. So that means you put in work. You push for electoral reform. You push to make sure we get campaign finance reform to decommodify elections. So this new institution that we build, if we make it viable, doesn't get corrupted in the same way that Democrats become corrupted. But with that being said, like overall, like it's nice to watch this and like listen to intelligent people speak who have more than just platitudes. Like if you fo follow this, like if you tuned into it, like it's honestly therapeutic in a way. And again, I haven't watched all of it yet, but like it's therapeutic because... You see people saying the same exact thing and it feels like you're not crazy anymore when you watch this, right? Like you see people who actually care about policy and that's that's refreshing, which it shouldn't be because if you're in politics, like if you follow politics, that should be like what you focus on. But I mean, not in 2020 America. So having said all of that, I'm rooting for the People's Party. Uh, I want to help the People's Party. Uh, we all have to help the People's Party to make sure that if this does become a thing. I don't know what like what's involved with creating a new party, but like we have to get electoral reform to make sure we don't only just have a majoritarian system um, and we have to make sure that we have electoral reform uh, or uh, campaign finance reform. We have to have those two things to make this actually successful and not just be like some fringe party. Like we want to push this into the mainstream. That's the ultimate goal, of course. So electoral reform, campaign finance reform. But having said all of that, I'll shut up now and let the people who attended this, uh, who are brilliant, speak. These are my favorite parts from the convention. Capitalism doesn't uh, separate itself from racism. You cannot fix something that was built to be broken. We have to shatter the systems that oppress us and rebuild everything for all of us. The audacity of both parties in this country to say we cannot afford universal health care when Democrats and Republicans both fund our war machine. Well, guess what? It's time for us, the people, to be audacious. I'm sure you've all noticed that the two-party system is not working for everybody. In fact, it's only working for corporate America and the wealthy elites. They fear the third party more than anything else. And guess who knows that from experience? You're looking at him. See, they think we're stupid. They think we're stupid. 
They think we're afraid. How are we ever going to stop the racial injustice crisis when both parties are in the pockets of the for-profit prison industry? How are we ever going to stop the cost of healthcare crisis and the lack of healthcare crisis when both parties are in the pockets of big pharma and the giant insurance companies? How are we ever going to stop the economic inequality crisis when both parties are in the pockets of the billionaire class? There have been people in every generation that have taken the wheel, had pushed back against the forces that were transgressing against our principles and did what it took to get this country back on track. It is simply our turn. 57 years and three days ago, the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American empire died in Ghana. His name was W.E.B. Du Bois. And that next morning, young brother Martin Luther King told America about a dream that he had, which was not the American dream, but a dream rooted in the American dream and has everything to do with the movement for People's Party. Because what we're talking about here is a people who muster the wherewithal, who have not just the courage, but the fortitude, the fortitude to fructify. And by fructify, I mean to generate the fruits of truth telling, to generate the truth of justice seeking, to generate the truth of kindness and sweetness and gentleness in how we relate to each other, but with a steel spine when it comes to bearing witness in the face of oppression. Hello, somebody. See, this poem encapsulates this very moment. Brother Langston Hughes is talking about this very moment. I hope you caught what he said. He said, telling others to get together, whites and Filipinos, Negroes and Mexicans, all kinds of kids will die who don't believe in lies and bribes and contentment and a lousy peace. That is what the movement for a People's Party is all about. Well, Democratic Party primaries in Massachusetts took place today, and we've got mixed results. Like, overall, I feel disappointed, but I'm satisfied because we still got one really crucial victory. So I'm going to start off with the good news. Ed Markey, in his race against Joe Kennedy the third, just killed the dynasty. So, a Kennedy has never lost a race in Massachusetts. This is the very first time a Kennedy has lost in this state, and he lost by a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> At the time I record this, Ed Markey has 54.8% of the vote, whereas Joseph Kennedy III has 45.2% of the vote. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'd like to call an ass whooping. <laughs> I love this. That smug little elitist prick just lost to Ed Markey. Uh, Nancy Pelosi came out to endorse Joseph Kennedy III. Beto O'Rourke came out to endorse Joseph Kennedy III, and Joseph Kennedy III lost. Seems like it's more important to get AOC's endorsement than it is to have Nancy Pelosi's endorsement. Hmm. Seems like the political winds are starting to change, slowly but surely. Um, now, what I like about this race is that it forced Ed Markey to really be as progressive as he can possibly be. Like he, unlike most incumbents, did not run towards the center. He actually leaned into his progressive record. Now, he doesn't have the most progressive record ever. In fact, I have some issues with him. Like he voted for the Iraq war. He didn't endorse Bernie Sanders in 2016 or 2020, but he is a sponsor of the Green New Deal. He has been, you know, shifting towards supporting Medicare for all. And I believe him more than I believe Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy doesn't even think that weed should be legal. So I love this. Um, what I will say is that it's time for the left officially to stop standing Ed Marquis because he's not that great. He's definitely better than Joe Kennedy. 
Uh, but I think that a lot of his progressive bona fides that he was boasting about, you know, it was a little bit hyperbolic. Now, you know, we're going to hold him to that and make sure that he actually lives up to all of these progressive promises. But let me just say, if Joe Kennedy were able to win and beat Ed Markey, we would be in far worse situation. So I am really thankful that Ed Markey won. And again, I'm just, I'm really glad that Nancy Pelosi's preferred candidate did not win. Now, you see a little bit of salt online. Nate Silver of 538 posted, you know, incumbents win all of the time. So this isn't a victory for the left, but it kind of is. Like, without the left and this momentum, Ed Markey would have lost. Because if you look at early polls from this state, Joe Kennedy was in the lead. But Ed Markey not only closed that gap, but ended up winning by a landslide. And in spite of the fact that he was the incumbent, Ed Markey is the one who was kind of the underdog in this race, even if he was the incumbent, because the establishment was a line behind Joe Kennedy. So, I mean, it's nice to have this victory, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this victory. Now, there are two other races that I was paying really close attention to. Of course, the Alex Morse race going up against Richie Neal, who's the head of the House Ways and Means Committee. And then also, Isan Leke. She was actually running for Joe Kennedy the third's vacant seat, because he left his House seat, of course, to run for the U.S. Senate. Let's get to those results. In the first congressional district of Massachusetts, Richard Neal unfortunately defeated Alex Morse, 60.3% to 39.7% at the time I record this video. Results are still coming in, and I'm assuming that there are more mail-in ballots that are uh, left to be counted. However, it's a really big gap, and if he closes this, I'd be surprised. But this shows that, you know, if he comes back in two years, he can actually pull this off, as Cory Bush did. Now, when it comes to the 4th Congressional District, unfortunately... The individual who I was rooting for, Isan Leki, came in fifth place. This is a really, really crowded field. And, you know, she didn't do too bad considering, you know, she pulled in about 10% of the vote. But it looks like Jesse Mermel is going to be the one who uh, takes on this seat. I mean, this is a pretty blue-leaning district, so this will be the individual who most likely goes to Congress. Disappointing result. But not all hope is lost. Like, we got the Ed Markey victory. With Alex Morris, he's so close that if he came back in two years, as I stated earlier, I think he can pull this off. Isan Lecky, um, I want to see more from her because I think she was a really inspiring and phenomenal candidate. Like, she is an immigrant from Morocco. I brought her on the program and was just blown away. Like, she's she's brilliant. So she's someone that I want to see in politics again. Um, so when it comes to the Alex Morris campaign, some people are saying the reason why he lost possibly is because of the, uh, smear from Richie Neal. Like you all know what I'm referring to, the homophobic smear that was, uh, brought forward by college Democrats of Massachusetts, which the state Democratic Party in Massachusetts helped, you know, the, to coordinate and cover up. I don't necessarily know that that's the case because honestly, like from my perspective, I wasn't really following this race that closely. Like I knew of Alex Morris and supported his campaign, but that smear made me pay attention. Like that race in a way kind of catapulted Alex Morris into national prominence. Now the smear could have certainly hurt him because I mean, he was rising in the polls. So, you know, that was a way to stop his momentum but at the same time you know i don't know if it directly hurt him because when people found out about it that and you know they felt sympathy for alex morris they kind of rallied around him at least i did and a lot of other people that i know uh, who are following this did so you know it, it backfired in a way to where i don't know that i can say definitively the smear is what led to him losing but it's just a matter of like when you're running for the first time really this is all about building your brand building name recognition and, you know, if Alex Morris came back, he could pull this off. Like, look at Cori Bush. She lost by, what, 20 points in 2018 and came back and defeated Lacey Clay two years later. So if Morris is losing by 11 points, then uh, I feel really good about his chances in a couple of years. Now, that sucks. I want him in Congress now because he is a phenomenal candidate, very progressive. But, um... You know, you win some, you lose some. But maybe this is just going to be a pretty easy one we can um, knock out in uh, 2022. But at least, you know, Ed Markey won and we just took out Joe Kennedy. And, you know, any, uh, I think, hope that he'd run for president one day, it's, it's kind of not going to be possible now 
if you end up losing your house seat to challenge someone and then lose that race. Like, that's a bad look. So at least that's one corporate Democrat who we kind of knocked out who'd be another, you know, smug, insufferable centrist like Pete Buttigieg. Although I, I kind of feel like I don't know who's more insufferable between Pete Buttigieg and Joe Kennedy. Like, to me, they both irritate me for different reasons. Uh, but at least, you know, we don't have to deal with one of them for now. So that's good. So, I mean, all around, not the result that I had hoped for. But still, you know, uh, I'm going to take this as a, a solid night. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Adam Christensen running in Florida's third congressional district. He just won his primary and he is now facing off against a Republican in November. And he's here to talk about his race. So, Adam, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's nice to have you. So for whatever reason, like I miss your race. Um, I saw your platform. I loved everything. You were endorsed by Marianne Williamson and Andrew Yang. Um, this was a really important race. Like you were a candidate that I would have supported, but I don't know how you slipped through the cracks. And I didn't know about your campaign until after you won your primary. But this was a victory that I would have been really excited about and, uh, you know, excited to celebrate. So tell us a little bit about your campaign. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, honestly, um, it's kind of slipped through the cracks forever. It's North Central Florida, and uh, nobody ever realizes that, number one, there's races happening here, or number two, that you should even be paying attention to them, at least until about a month ago when Ted Yoho decided to make himself famous uh, and uh, go after AOC. And so that at that moment was when everyone was like, oh, 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 North Central Florida exists. Like, we should care about this. Uh, and so, I, in a way, it was almost a gift that Ted Yoho is such a horrible human being. But to be honest, I was surprised that nobody knew who he was before that because he had voted against making lynching a federal crime. Like, he didn't think the Civil Rights Act was constitutional. Like, he went against the ERA, like the Survivor's Bill of Rights. Like, this is who the guy was. And so he was one of those Tea Partiers that got in, um, and uh, he's been here ever since. Yeah, um, the Ted Yaho situation uh, that you're referring to was when he, you know, just out of the blue attacked AOC. Uh, I believe I talked about this on my program as well. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting race here. So tell me what's going on because you won the Democratic Party primary. You're going up against the Republican. And all of my viewers, like, they know about, you know, these races and they bring them to my attention. And this is no different. So I had a viewer actually reach out to me and say, hey, you've got to get Adam Christensen on the program. Why haven't you done this? And I didn't actually know about your race. So I feel really bad. And I'm glad that I'm correcting that right now. But what was the dynamic in your primary? Like how many people were competing? Like, was it relatively open? Like, how did you manage to win? Because what we're seeing this time in 2020 is that progressive candidates who are, you know, running on Medicare for all, uh, you know, a living wage, all of this, they're seeing a lot more success this time around than in 2018, which was kind of our first run where we had, you know, one big victory with AOC and a couple of other successes with Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. But this time it's completely different. I mean, we have Marie Newman, uh, Jamal Bowman, uh, you now winning your primary, Kari Eastman. I mean, the list goes on. So how did you do it? And, you know, what can you say to other candidates running in primaries in the next cycle? Yeah, so ours is a little bit different, a little bit special. So I am 26 years old, so I am the youngest congressional nominee in the country. On top of that, we started in January. We started almost seven months after everybody else, and uh, we had no money. We had no name recognition. Uh, we had basically nothing, and we got a bunch of college kids that basically, I mean, one, I, I went out and I started trying to get petitions and basically said, hey, this is what I wanna run on. I think this can work, and I think people need this. And one person joined and then another person joined. And within a week, we had about 10. And then within a couple months, we had about 50. And it was one of those things where it almost started organically. But the biggest thing that we did was, number one, we ran on principle. And we were able to actually connect with people. And so for us, we knew that we were never going to against our opponents. Uh, we had two opponents. One is a very progressive guy that has run I think this was his third time running for Congress in a row. Uh, the other guy had run previously as an independent uh, and had neither of them had done well in the general previously against Ted Yoho, but they had name recognition and they had some money. And so for us, it was number one, we had to build a field team. We had to actually do the groundwork. We had to get in with the activists. We had to do everything that we possibly could. Now, most of the people on our team were organizers and activists. That's most, that's what our entire team was made up of. And so for us, 
the way that we were able to actually get people to understand that number one, we existed and number one, they should care that we were running was because we actually integrated ourselves into everything that was going on. We had our name out there every single second of the day, every single podcast, every single news cycle, every single uh, newspaper that we possibly could. And it was a lot of hard work. But at the end of the day, hard work is not what is going to win you races like this necessarily. You're never going to win just based on ideology or based on what you believe you have to be able to actually win by coming up with a game plan and a strategy and, and capitalizing off of it. So for us immediately, what we realized is we cannot do this alone. And there are house district candidates that are running here that if they do well, we're going to do well. And so we partnered with four out of the five house district candidates running for the Florida house here in our congressional district immediately. One was a 23-year-old named Rock Abujadi, who was running just north of us. The other was a 23-year-old named Cynthia De La Rosa, who was running just south of us. Then we partnered with uh, the lady who had, her name was Yvonne Hayes Henson. She ran for Congress in this seat two years ago and lost, but she was running for state house. And then we were able to help and find somebody to run in the other district, because for us, you have to be able to attack every single acre of ground. You have to fight for everything in these rural districts. And what we also realized was we were never going to win the Democratic vote out of Alachua County. No nominee for this seat has ever not won Gainesville, University of Florida area, and gone on to be the nominee. We didn't win Gainesville. We had to win the rural counties and the rural vote in order to win this nomination. And that's what we focused on. We knew we had to get at least 33% and we got 34% and we were able to do it. And so number one, we executed the game plan. We came up with a game plan that was going to work and we built the coalitions that were gonna actually get us across the finish line. And that's exactly what it's gonna take to win in November as well. Yeah, so this is what I think you represent to me. So back in 2016, it was exciting to see congressional candidates who were kind of running on the same platform that Bernie Sanders was running on. But my hope then was that by 2018, we'd see more candidates. And we did. Um, and now in 2020, there's so many candidates running on the same platform of Medicare for all and whatnot. I can't keep track of them. And my hope for 2022 and 2024 is that there's so many candidates that are winning that that's what's difficult to keep track of. And you kind of represent this to where I didn't even see this. You came out of nowhere. And it's so exciting. Like I was really demoralized after the results from Florida because all of the candidates that I had followed, you know, Melville Pearson, uh, Jen Perlman had lost their races. So I thought I'm not even gonna make a video and cover this because I don't think there's any victories and then here you come along with my one of my viewers saying mike we just got a victory what are you doing so it's it's nice to see this like it's a good problem to have when you're winning and you don't even know it right uh so let me ask you about your opponent because you're facing off against the republican you kind of alluded to this race a little bit earlier but talk about your op your opponent who this individual is and how you plan to beat them yeah, so the first thing is, and one of the reasons it was a huge victory is we had a staff, the entire staff, all 50 people were under the age of 23. Wow. Entirely youth led. And the youngest nominee for Congress on the Democratic side, maybe ever, just won a race in North Central Florida, going for Ted Yoho's seat. That's and awesome. So, yeah, it was a victory and nobody saw it. I mean, we knew it was going to happen. We were excited about it. We thought it could, and we thought we would shock everyone. And it, it, it happened, and that was what was incredible. But at the same time, we knew that it was going to be a warm-up because yeah. the real battle and the real fight is the general election. Ted Yoho is resign or retiring um, for reasons that he claims. I don't think those are the reasons, but you know what? Let him have it. Fine. Yeah. His campaign manager, former chief of staff who he demoted to deputy chief of staff and then basically got rid of because he said, quote, she had no moral character. Uh, that is who is running in his stead with his backers, with his donors, with everything that uh, that he has built for the last eight years. So we are going against the Ted Yoho machine. It's just not his name on the ballot. Um, they had 10 Republicans on that side. That was their primary. The person who won, which was her, got 24 percent of the vote. We thought it was going to be another guy named Judson Sapp, who had the backing of Roger Stone, Matt Gates, all of these people. And uh, he did not. She won. Um, at the same time, which was incredible, was the fact that uh, we thought she might get fourth or fifth. Now, what it's going to take to actually win, we basically ran a general election strategy in a primary. That almost never works. For us, we have to cut the margins in the rural counties. We have to win a couple of the rural counties, and we have to actually compete there. No Democrat has ever really tried to compete there. 
we're going to run up the score in Gainesville and Alachua County in the University of Florida area with the Democrats, with the progressives, just because that's what's going to happen. Um, but for us, the biggest inroads have to come in the rural counties, specifically Clay County. Um, their sheriff was just arrested, um, and about a month ago, he claimed that he was going to deputize every gun owner and send them after the Black Lives Matter protesters. So this is the kind of like place that we have to make inroads in. The way that we were able to do that, we actually won Clay County in the Democratic primary. The way that we do that, number one, you don't water down policy. But what you can do is you can frame it in a way not just to make it financial, but emotional. And that's something I feel like progressives, especially here, have never been able to do. It's something Republicans do phenomenally well. They make everything emotional where they don't have a good product, but they make people want it, despite the fact they don't even have a product. And so for us, you know, we talk really about uh, almost classical conservative values. I'm talking the original progressive Republicans. I'm talking like going after monopolies, going after middlemen, going after people like the insurance companies who nobody likes insurance companies. Nobody likes cable companies. Nobody likes towing companies. These people are just there designed to take our money. And that is who we're going to go against is these predatory companies. And so we talk a, a lot like that. I, I call Medicare for all a small business tax cut because small businesses are on the line for health care. And it's almost $8,000 per employee per year. You get rid of that cost on small businesses. Small businesses can now raise wages. They can now compete with the big guys. They can now recruit. And on top of that, you just lower the amount of costs they have. So it's a small business tax cut because you're removing the private taxes. That is the shift we have made. We have made the connection between there are two types of taxes, government taxes and private taxes. And right now, you are paying far more to private corporations than you ever would be to the government. And most people here, they only care about what it's going to cost them and whether or not it's going to be a good investment. And you connect those dots, you connect it with the original like Teddy Roosevelt going after billionaires, going after scammers, going after people that we bailed out, but we never got money back from. And that's a solid argument to make, especially in the conservative counties. And you can do that with, a, with, with left progressive values that actually resonate. In fact, one of the craziest kind of like coalitions that we've seen is almost the far right John Bircher society kind of people pairing with environmentalists to go after Nestle. Nobody would think that's possible because Nestle is coming in to destroy, basically bottle water out of our springs, which would destroy a town called High Springs in this area, which would destroy their way of life. And so now you're seeing all these conservatives rise up with environmentalists and say, no, we don't want that. And so you're seeing kind of this crazy, almost coalition forming that I don't think would have happened five to 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And your strategy makes sense because you're meeting people where they are, which is crucial. Like what we see from the National Democratic Party is that they often times will try to adjust their message to appeal to Republicans, but they water down their own policy. And, you know, they talk about how they are a big tent party. But that's not a winning message. Like people don't want to vote for Republican light candidates. They want to vote for people who are authentic that are, you know, addressing their specific needs. And so when we see candidates like you and Donna Imim, you know, in the 31st Congressional uh, District of Texas, winning but not watering down your message and actually appealing to people who the Democratic Party is trying to get right now, I, it's frustrating to me. And I'm like banging my head against the wall because why don't they get this message? Why can't they do what you all are doing. Like, what is your critique of the National Democratic Party? Because I think that it's so simple when you break it down about the way you appeal to conservative voters. Like, saying that Medicare for All is a small business tax cut, it's brilliant. Why can't they get this, you know, through their heads at the national level? You know, I, and, and this is one thing that I think has really helped us is, you know, I grew up a conservative. A lot of people on our campaign grew up Republicans. And what they saw is a shift where the Republican Party, number one, didn't care about them, but also didn't care about people. Where I grew up, what I believed and what my family always believed was that neither party cared whether or not we lived or died. They just didn't. And at the end of the day, it was the corporate Democrats and the corporate Republicans. And to most people, they're one and the same. There is no difference between them because at the end of the day, they don't do anything for us. And so my opponent, Kat Kamek, is, is the embodiment of that. I mean, that is her. She worked in Washington for eight years, but did anything change here? Did anything get better? No. 
She didn't stand up to Ted Yoho when he voted against making lynching a federal crime. She said nothing. He, she didn't stand up when he verbally assaulted a woman on the Capitol steps. She said nothing. So if she's not going to stand up to her former boss when he does something outrageous like that, who is she going to stand up for? It's definitely not us. And so at the end of the day, what people care about and what I was always taught to care about is that, that, that actions always speak louder than words. And it doesn't matter what somebody tells you. It matters what they're going to do and what they're actually going to put into motion. And so that's the biggest thing I think the Democratic Party needs to do. I am tired of this Rahm Emanuel. I don't, I would advise Joe Biden not to go for Medicare for all. I advise him not to go for a Green New Deal. No, nobody respects you, Rahm. And the reason is you have no morals, you have no character, and every single independent and Republican sees right through it. What happens to Democrats is when you water down your message and you no longer stand for anything, nobody respects you. At least people respect other people that have values and are willing to fight for them. They may not agree, but they can actually find common ground because they respect the fact that you care. When you don't care about anything, there's no common ground to be found. And right now, I think the Democratic Party has struggled with that for 40 years because when you only care about donations and corporate PACs and how much your donors are going to give you and what they care about, you don't care about anybody else. And at the end of the day, the only person you care about is yourself. And nobody likes that. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to like pick your brain a little bit because I think that you really you've nailed how to appeal to voters in rural areas. Um, so one thing that I see, one thing that we heard during the primary, uh, the presidential primary, that is, is that, you know, you can't go too far left and support something like Medicare for all because Republicans are going to call you a crazy socialist. Well, Joe Biden isn't going far left. He doesn't support Medicare for all. And guess what Republicans are calling him? A crazy socialist. So, I mean, how do you? Yeah, exactly. And that's always going to be the playbook. So what is your response to that? Like if you, you know, uh, come into contact with a voter that says, I don't want, you know, socialism, that's crazy. Like, how do you respond to that? Because a lot of this is just they are basing their assumptions about people who support policies like Medicare for all off of fear mongering. But to me, like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the way that you get them to get off of that mindset is just by educating them and informing them about these policies. So how do you respond to claims of, oh, I'm a crazy socialist? Because I'm sure your opponent is already doing that about you. My opponent doesn't have an attack line that she can actually stick to. She talks about socialism, but then she's okay with giving the big, biggest companies in the world corporate welfare. Like my opponent says that I'm a socialist, but at the same time, she's been okay with for 40 years having corporate socialism. Like it makes no sense. They're going to call you whatever they're going to call you. And what I don't understand is why people believe that by giving ground in a negotiation, you're actually helping your side. That's not how that works. That is not how negotiations work. If you go in with a small business and you're trying to get investment, you ask for more than you ever think they're going to give you because at the end of the day, they might give you what you wanted at the first point. The same thing with any negotiation. You always go in with things you don't want that you think are pie in the sky that you may will never get. But when you get up those things, when you actually compromise some things that you never wanted in the first place, but you put in there so you could compromise them, you end up where you wanted. You start with a national health care system, you'll get Medicare for all. You start with Medicare for all, you'll get a public option. You start with a public option, you get the ACA. You get a right wing Republican health care plan. And so people like Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> these people don't know how to negotiate. They've never known how to negotiate and they give ground before they're even forced to. And what we know is that is the last thing that you should do. You always go in farther than you believe you'll ever get. And then when you compromise, you end up where you want it. Rahm Emanuel doesn't understand that. Rahm Emanuel is the reason that we don't have progress in this country. People like him, that's the reason that the people that I grew up with hated the Democratic Party. They don't stand for anything. They're not willing to fight for anything. At the end of the day, they're only caring about themselves and whether or not they're going to keep their position and their money and their donors. And nobody likes that. Yeah, it's the smug elitism while simultaneously claiming that you have, you know, the moral high ground, which, as you stated, like people see through that, like it's inauthentic. We know that they're being disingenuous. Um, So you alluded to this. You also referenced this on your website, but you were someone who grew up as a Republican. So I think that your perspective kind of gives you that extra insight that's needed. Like you can appeal to people who, you know, the uh, what do they call it? The uh, 
West Coast elites or the, you know, coastal elites, I think that's the phrase, I'm, I'm blanking on it. You know, you appeal to the people who those types of Democrats aren't able to appeal to. So can you walk us through, like, what was it that was the spark that, you know, got you to leave the Republican Party um, and become a leftist? Like, what was it for you? Because we kind of all have our same story. Like, I, I reference how I grew up as an evangelical. Um, but, like, what is your story? Like, how did you become a lefty? You know, I think your and my story is probably probably pretty close. Um, I grew up in the church. I mean, I was in the church from like the day I was three years old or whenever yeah. my parents could get me out of there out of the hospital. Um, and I grew up believing, you know, the people that you're supposed to care about, you know, morally, the, the way you're supposed to live your life, your character is what matters, whether or not people see it or not. Um, and the people that taught me that as I was growing up, you know, I fully believed it. And I believed that uh, the way that, you know, you look at politics, the way that you look at anything is supposed to help people. Well, what I realized as I was growing up is the people that were telling me this, they were not fulfilling the message of the church. They were not fulfilling the message, the mandate of what we were supposed to do. I mean, the greatest radicals that I learned about in the history books, uh, in the church, they were the ones that did not spend time with the elites. They did not spend time with <laughs> the religious leaders. They spent time with the people, with the poor, with the hungry, with the sick. And they said that how you treat those people is a reflection on who you are and what society you live in. Well, what I saw is the church was not living those values. The people that I grew up with and taught me that, they didn't care about those people except for when they were at church on Sunday, reading the Bible. And so for me, when I looked at both parties, I number one realized that the Republican Party, I could not reform. There was nothing I could do there. But the Democratic Party at least stated, or at least they originally stated, or at least they used to be for workers, for people, for the people that mattered, for people like me. That's something you can reform. It may not be perfect, and no party is gonna be perfect, and no leadership is gonna be perfect, but at least there's a shot there. And so for me, as I was going through college, it was that, it was that transition of, well, what kind of life do I wanna lead? What, what do I want people to see from me? What kind of character and morals do I want to have? And I believe at the end of the day that left politics, that populist politics, that the way that I grew up, it is better reflected through things like Medicare for all and making sure that parents don't go bankrupt because their kid gets cancer than it is to just say that, well, if you get sick, you're on your own and hopefully you don't die. One of those is moral, the other isn't. And so for me, really the moral argument took over, but now even the economic argument is taken over because all these things are cheaper. They're better investments. If I was a small business owner, I would want universal childcare because it's a high ROI. <laughs> like the return on investment of universal childcare is 1.25, which is a great investment every single year. Education, same thing. I mean, you talk about Medicare for all, it's cheaper than what we do now. You can literally make the Republican argument. You wanna get rid of the scammers, the middlemen, the bureaucracy, the red tape, and make sure it's a free market? Get rid of the insurance companies. Make sure that the pharmaceutical industry can't price fix and we can actually negotiate drug prices. That's a conservative argument. But apparently I'm a lefty socialist for wanting a free market in the healthcare system. That's fine. <laughs> and you really see like, the arguments that you make reflected even in your pitches. Like if you go to your website where you say, I support Medicare for all, you have a chart that shows the cost and how we're spending more than other countries. And this is kind of the same thing that I see with other candidates running in red states or red districts like Donna Imam and Kara Eastman. So it's interesting the way that you guys tweak those arguments. And in a way, I think that you're selling it better than us because I mean, it's really easy and simplistic to make a moral argument and say, hey, do you want people to die if they don't have health care or do you not? Like it's common in sense but it's not getting through to the people who already you know are susceptible to that, to that type of argument so you have to take it a step further and you have to defang all of these counter arguments and the economic argument is the one that we still see even for the people who buy into the moral argument so i think that what you're doing it's it's brilliant honestly and I, i'm curious to see uh, how this pans out. I think you're really in a good position to win. This race is important because you state that, um, you know, we're going to be looking at redistrict redistricting. Um, and if Florida goes blue, then that will change a lot. So talk about what could happen in the event um, Florida actually does flip to blue and how that will impact the future of House in terms of like where the lines are drawn uh, congressionally. 
Yeah. So in case anybody didn't know or wasn't aware for the last however long, Florida is very gerrymandered. And the years that you can change that is, uh, well, this year. Whoever owns the Florida House controls the boundaries. So for us and the Florida Democratic Party, this is something that the Florida Democratic Party has not done and they should have done every single time. This is one of those things that we talked about earlier. You cannot play defense anymore. We can't do that. You never play a man down in any sport whatsoever because at the end of the day, you're going to lose more than you win. So the Florida Democratic Party for the last 20, 30 years has tried to play 8 v. 11. That is what they've tried to do. They have not run candidates in districts they didn't think would be close. Now, what does that mean? That means that the Republicans in those districts, they don't have to spend any money. They don't have to spend any time. They don't have to campaign. They don't have to worry about it. What that also means is they can go double or triple team the person next door who is in a contested race and pour all their money into that one. And what also happens is sometimes you have people that uh, drop out of races, but if there's no Democrat in that race to begin with, they don't win. So what are we doing here? What are we thinking about? The number one way to win the Florida House, and it's exactly what Virginia did. There was a group called 90 for 90, uh, civil rights and, and also voting activists, uh, really famous, uh, the, the Reeds, uh, Dr. Fergie Reed and his father. Um, they said, we are going to run a candidate everywhere every single house district and we're going to fight for every single acre of land and we're going to force republicans to spend money time and basically create a war of attrition and they did and they flipped the virginia house now they decided the next one that needs to go is florida right before redistricting and here's how we're going to do it so they as long as well as a group called the the, the Democratic Environmental Caucus of Florida, Janelle Christensen, who is not a relation of mine, but I get that question all the time. They decided we are going to find and fund scientists, environmentalists for all of these races. Find anyone that we can get to get in this race, at least get on the ballot and give them support to actually be able to run and organize and basically become field organizers. And so they did. Now, our race has five House districts within it, within the congressional district. Um, there was only going to be three people running in those in those House districts, which means Republicans were going to win two of them without even having to try. Well, that didn't happen. And what we've seen now is if we're able to cut the margins in a couple of those House districts, we force Republicans to spend money there when they don't want to. We force the contested races in other House districts to have an easier shot and not have to focus all their time and resources and effort. And so what we are seeing now is if North Central Florida goes blue, a couple of our House districts go blue, the rest of it will. Joe Biden wins the presidency, we win our congressional seat, and the Florida House flips right before redistricting, which means Democrats have a shot for the next 10 years instead of playing defense. And so this is the one year that we have decided, number one, we're gonna organize, we're gonna do this better than we've ever done it before, and we're gonna have a new strategy where we actually can win and not just compete. Yeah, and I think that's the key. Like, you can't just play defense, you have to play offense. And I feel like not a lot of people understand that, but you do, which is why I'm definitely rooting for you. So I want you to tell us what we can do to help you get elected. I think that anyone who's watched to this point is already sold on your campaign. Tell us how close you are to flipping that seat and what we can do to get you across the finish line. We got to pull it within three points. We pull it within three points. We're going to get all the funding we need in the world to be able to get to that three point margin. We need we need money. We need donations. We need volunteers, phone banking, text banking, all of it. Uh, we are building a grassroots army <laughs> full of organizers and activists. We've even had progressive campaigns that ended in other states that had giant organizations that are throwing them behind us because they realize that this is the pivot point in Florida. And so what we are going to be doing is focusing on independence. Democrats to turn them out and we are going to be phone banking text banking we are going to do everything possible at a massive scale in order to win when we win things are going to change drastically and so right now uh, we think that this is the pivot point of Florida and I think nationally people are starting to realize that it could be the pivot point for Florida uh, so you can give donations you can go to our website you can follow us on Twitter social media you can amplify anything that we put out at the end of the day, anything that you're able to do is going to help us. And at the end of the day, if the progressive left, the progressive, uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the left flex their muscle in a deep red state and flip a seat, that shows power. 
that moves you from just primarying people to a point where you are on the attack and you are able to show that you are serious and you can move your caucus from 50 members to 100. And that is serious political power. And so I think that the progressive left needs to be able to start flipping seats like mine. And I think we can be the focal point in the start of it, start of something much bigger. So that's kind of, that's the pitch. I mean, right there, especially to people like you is, look, we can do this. We got the plan to do this. And I think we're going to. I think so too. I think that you have the right strategy and the correct approach that you need to win. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, do we have enough people jumping on board to help you? So I definitely would encourage all of my viewers to do what they can to help you, even if, you know, you don't live in Florida's third congressional district. If you live across the country, you know, just a couple of bucks, if that's all you got, can really make a difference. Because, I mean, if you were to get elected to Congress, this would be huge, as you stated. It would give us, you know, um, the clout and show that we are capable of getting real political power and affecting change in a meaningful way. So, I mean, this is really an important race. So uh, I'm so glad that I am, you know, that you're on my radar and I'm rooting for you now. Oh, I really appreciate, I really appreciate that. It's been kind of great. I met Mark Hamill the other day. Did you really? For greatest day of my life. I'm not gonna lie. I was, Interesting. I, was, uh, I may, may have shed some tears or at least our <laughs> communications director did, but yeah, so. That was cool, but at the same time, like, we've got groups all over the country that are realizing this, that this red district is flippable and it's close. The last polling was done two and a half years ago. Nobody knows what it looks like now. It was a plus nine then, now we don't have, now it's an open seat, which is probably a 2.4% swing. We got felony disenfranchisement, which got knocked down in Florida. That's a little bit that most people aren't thinking about. We got the fact that Florida right now is leading vote by mail ballots. And as we all know, if you have an absentee or vote by mail ballot, you are more likely to vote than actually going to the polls. And so across the country, if you can lead in those things right there, you've got a chance to actually close the gap. We got to close a gap of about 30,000, 35,000 votes. There are almost 40 to 45,000 Hispanic and Latino voters that nobody has ever asked to come vote for them in the last election. We've got conservative and independent women right now that are completely upset with the way that this district has been handled and the fact that people like Kat Kamek won't even stand up for themselves, let alone other women, when they are attacked. That right there, mm -mm, not, not a good thing. Like our campaign is run by 76% progressive women. They're all terrifying, they could all kill me, and they know <laughs> they could kill me, and so I love it, and like our team is phenomenal. And, and, and you've probably seen the TikToks, the videos, everything like that, but they care and they're willing to do the work and they're not willing to just sit back because for us, it has to happen now and we don't have any other choice because if yeah. we don't do something very shortly, Florida's underwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to act right now. And this campaign, what I love about it is like it's it's all run by Zoomers, which is awesome. Like that's where all the energy is coming from. And like I am already so much more prouder of Zoomers than I am of millennials. Like I love my generation, but like they're just they they have this fire that we didn't have like immediately. Like growing up, we had that, you know, excitement of Obama. You know, I was excited about Obama. And then for Zoomers, they're like graduating into the apocalypse. So they don't have that false sense of hope. So they're just getting to work immediately, you know? So it, it's awesome to see that fire. But at the same time, I feel bad because they shouldn't have to fight for their lives like this. But I mean, you know, the fact that they're, they're doing all of this and they're seeing so much success already, it does give me hope. So look, shout out to your team. Uh, we're rooting for you. Um, we'll put links to the website down below. Adam Christian, Christensen running in Florida's third congressional district. We will be watching this race very closely because I think you're going to pull this out. That is everything. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the people who make it possible. Our very generous Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are the lifeblood of this program. And I am truly, truly grateful for your patronage. Um, so that's all I've got. I am off next week. But since this episode is so big, of course, um, I will be gradually posting segments from this episode throughout the course of the week. So, you know, we've got to feed that algorithm on YouTube. So, of course, there's still going to be content. But I am going to take the week off to celebrate my 10th anniversary and third wedding anniversary with my husband. And I think that I really, I need the mental health break. <laughs> I need to, like, 
take a little bit of time to check out, but not entirely. I'll still be on Twitter. Um, I'll still be following the news, but just not making a video about it, not having to like analyze it and think about it from this perspective as like a pundit will help me out a little bit. Like it'll just, it'll be nice to have a little bit of a vacation. So um, not do anything, staying home, but nonetheless, I, th I think it'll still like really, really be uh, nice. So yeah. I'll see you all in two weeks. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Have a nice week.